Thank you. The next item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion 15907 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Budget Scotland No. 3 Bill. And uh, before the debate begins, I'm required understanding orders to state whether or not any provision in this bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system uh, or franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. And in the case of this bill, it does no such thing. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed. The Cabinet Secretary will be very relieved to hear. Uh, could, I invite, could I invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak button uh, as soon as possible? And I call on the Cabinet Secretary, Derek Mackay, to open the budget. Of all, a majority would be super uh, for the budget <laughs> uh, tonight. I'm delighted to lead this debate today on the final stage of the budget bill. A budget that ensures we provide the necessary certainty that the country deserves and expects. I would like to thank, first of all, the, all the Parliament's committees for their deliberations, especially considering the process changes we made following the agreement of Parliament. And I can confirm that I've responded formally to the Finance and Constitution Committee's report on the budget. This budget safeguards Scotland as best we can, using all of the powers and resources at our disposal with a clear focus on the priorities as a nation. Education, the economy, the NHS, the environment, and support for our communities, to name just a few. Education, a top priority for the Scottish Government, benefits from over £180 million to raise attainment in schools, and will transform early learning and childcare with a record £500 million expansion. And will continue our investment in skills and talent through investing over £600 million in Scotland's colleges, £1 billion in universities and £214 million on apprenticeships and skills for young people. On health, the budget will deliver on our commitment to pass on health consequentials in full, including and increasing the health resource budget by over £730 million, an increase of around £500 million in real terms. And this increases the investment in social care and integration to more than £700 million. It also provides an additional £27 million directly for mental health services, taking the overall funding for mental health to £1.1 billion. And under the circumstances, the 2019-20 budget delivers a fair financial settlement for local government by providing over £11.2 billion, which is a real terms increase of almost £300 million. In total, of course, James Kelly. <clears throat> the Cabinet Secretary for taking the interve uh, intervention. On the, the issue of fairness, do you think it's fair that a Chief Executive earning £120,000 a year will get a tax cut as a result of this budget, but Dundee City Council will have to cut their edu education budget by £3 million? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, matter of fact, the education budget is going up in the city of Dundee. It is, uh, the education portfolio is increasing in real terms as well. Why is it that the shadow cabinet of the Labour Party is adopting the Tory tax plans on income tax when the Scottish Government is rejecting the Tory tax plans on income tax? In total, presiding officer, overall spending power for local authorities next year will potentially be up by some £620 million higher than it is currently. Whilst at the same time we're protecting household budgets by continuing to protect a cap on council tax increases, with overall levels of council tax continuing to be significantly less than in Tory-run England. On a cross-party basis, local government has lobbied for more discretion rate taxes. Yes, I will. Graeme Simpson. Okay, thank you for taking the intervention. Why is it then that uh, every single council in Scotland is having to make cuts? Cabinet Secretary. The, as I have just expressed, the Scottish Government is giving more money to local councils, a real terms increase to local government coming from the Scottish Government and improved spending power of over £620 million. But do you know what? If I had followed Tory tax plans, £500 million would have to come out of public services to fund their tax plans. 
or the calamity of Brexit. Think what that would do to our public services across Scotland. But what we've done is listen to local government on a cross-party basis. And that even includes, includes Tories demanding for a power that they now say shouldn't be transferred to local government. What hypocrites in the Conservative Party. I have, I have reached a deal with the Greens to take forward our empowerment agenda. On local tax reform, we'll see the empowerment of local authorities supporting local democracies to develop local solutions. So we will convene a cross-party arrangement around talks on replacing the current council tax and publish legislation by the end of this parliament to implement any agreement. And on the agreement to support new powers for local authorities, we will formally consult on the principles of a locally determined tourist tax and introduce legislation that would permit local authorities to introduce such a levy if they consider it appropriate in local circumstances. We'll also support an agreement to the amendment to the transport bill that would enable councils who wish to use such a power to introduce a workplace parking levy. Now, the use of such a power will be entirely an individual choice for each local authority. And as has already been noted in the chamber, in England and Wales, Tory-run England, where councils already have the power, Nottingham is the only council to have used it. And as I understand it, it, neither Glasgow nor Edinburgh, those perceived most likely to deploy the levy, are intending to promote it in financial year 2019-20. So how about this? So rather than focus on what's not happening in 2019-20, maybe the Conservatives should focus on what is happening in 2019-20. So this budget delivers a competitive package on business rates measures to help our businesses grow, prosper and be successful. It delivers the most generous business rates relief package anywhere in the UK, worth more than three quarters of a billion pounds, with capped poundage increases below inflation, ensuring that 90% of properties in Scotland pay less than in other parts of the UK. And it continues the growth accelerator to provide a further competitive advantage for Scotland's businesses. Our economic action plan sets out the measures to build a strong, vibrant and diverse and dynamic economy, an ambitious national infrastructure mission, the National Investment Bank, an investment of more than £5 billion of capital funding in our infrastructure, investing £1.7 billion in transport and connectivity, £180 million towards city and growth deals, and we're also establishing an £18 million advanced manufacturing challenge fund and boosting town centres with a new £50 million capital fund. And a record £826 million will be invested in housing, delivering affordable homes in communities across Scotland. So this budget expands the use of our new, it devolved social security responsibility powers to create a system based on dignity and respect. With a total forecast expenditure of £435 million in financial year 2019-20. It delivers real action to tackle poverty and support families on low incomes, investing over £100 million to directly mitigate against the worst impacts of UK government welfare cuts, including mitigating the bedroom tax in full. Yeah, yeah. On the subject of tax, as approved by the rate resolution this week, the budget ensures that 55% of Scottish taxpayers continue to pay less than they would if they lived elsewhere in the UK, with Scotland continuing to be the lowest and the fairest tax part of the UK. But, presiding officer, and I ask Parliament to approve this budget later today, I must draw attention to the work of the Chief Economist Works published today. The Chancellor's budget was constructed on the basis of an orderly Brexit, as was the Scottish budget. And with just over a month to go before Scotland faces being dragged out of the EU by the UK Tory government, we face the real and increasingly likely possibility that the UK will crash out without a deal. This government continues to believe that the best outcome for the UK and for Scotland is to remain within the EU. The choice is not no deal 
or the Prime Minister's deal. In fact, the Prime Minister's deal would make Scotland poorer as well. The UK government, the UK government is systematically damaging our economy, austerity by choice, Brexit by design, and any form of Brexit damages our economy and our people. Even though investment decisions have already been impacted, our economy has proven so far to be resilient with GDP growth and record low unemployment. That economic success is now at risk by the increasing Brexit uncertainty and in particular the no deal scenario. Today the chief economist in the Scottish Government has published a report and I think it's important that the people of Scotland know this, showing that a no deal Brexit would lead to a major dislocation of the Scottish economy. A no deal Brexit would be expected to push the Scottish economy into recession during 2019. There is the potential for the economy to contract by between 2.5% and 7% by the end of 2019, depending on the way in which a no-deal Brexit evolves. Now, such an economic slowdown would be expected to result in unemployment rising from its current record low level, potentially soaring by 100,000 people in Scotland being made unemployed. This would be an economic shock on the scale of a 2008 financial crisis. So Scotland should not have to pay such a heavy price for the incompetence of the Conservative <laughs> Government. Of course. Murder Fraser. Well, surely the Finance Secretary sets out the scenario of a no-deal Brexit being so appalling is that not an argument for SNP MPs to back the deal on the table for the Prime Minister? Cabinet Secretary. You see the choice. Remember, remember on the, the street of Downing Street, outside number 10, when the Prime Minister said there was a choice. Hard deal, no deal, or no Brexit. We'll take no Brexit. Thank you very much. That is, a, that is a false choice, a false choice. The Tories asking the people of Scotland, how much damage would you like to come upon the people of Scotland? That's what the Tories, through their gamble and their recklessness, has taken us to. It's appalling, and the economic credibility of the Tories is about to be shattered uh, before our eyes. No deal Brexit is not just a hypothetical, it's impacting on our economy now and must be avoided at all costs. That's what happens when we leave the economy of Scotland in the hand of the Conservatives. And I say, of course I'm working on an economic response in the event of a no-deal Brexit, but we will have no choice in this Parliament but to revisit the spending proposals and priorities to limit the economic self-harm being imposed upon Scotland by Westminster. But with all the best will in the world, devolution and the current limited powers will not be enough yep. to mitigate the economic catastrophe that is coming our way. There are new converts to the notion that Westminster is broken, including some of its own members. I'm just wondering what took them so long to realise it. In sharp contrast, Scotland's Parliament must show leadership, stability, yep. consensus, compromise and, importantly, delivery. This Parliament is at its best when all parties engage constructively and surely the nation's finances and the decisions we make on our public services deserve serious engagement. After all, decisions are indeed made by those who turn up. And although this year unionist parties may have been in the room, credible budget alternatives were absent. Whether that was the Lib Dems and the Tories putting their constitutional obsession before public services or the Labour Party too busy arguing amongst themselves, it was only the Greens who engaged constructively. So the passage of the budget today provides £42.5 billion of investment in our public services and our economy to the benefit of the people of Scotland. In approving this year's budget, we make the investments for the here and now, 
whilst building for our future, safeguarding Scotland. And I do also hope that this is a turning point for the opposition who would gain so much more for their constituents by working with us on the budget. Our Parliament in Scotland can offer the modern progressive style of politics focused on the common good with looking at the opportunities and challenges we face together. That's why I have strived to deliver stability, sustainability and economic stimulus. And that's why I'm so proud to commend this budget to the Chamber today. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And I now call Murdo Fraser to open for the Conservative Party. Murdo Fraser. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. When the, uh, oh, Mr. Lyle, don't worry, I'm coming to you very <laughs> soon. Uh, Presiding Officer, when the Finance Secretary introduced his budget to Parliament at stage one just three weeks ago, I described it as a pay more, get less budget. And that description still holds. Well, it doesn't do justice to what has turned into an omni-shambles budget. Yeah. For over the last three weeks, this is a budget deal which has faced criticism. Criticism for a lack of transparency. Criticism because of the tax hikes that are being introduced that will hit the poorest families in Scotland the hardest. And criticism because of the cuts in local government services that are being handed down, which mean that families across Scotland will be paying more in tax at the same time as they are seeing the services they depend upon being reduced. So let me start with the issue of transparency. Both the Finance Secretary and indeed the First Minister told opposition parties throughout this budget process that every penny in the budget had been accounted for. And yet we now know that there were additional Barnet consequentials from the UK Government, which the Finance Secretary was given notice of on Friday the 25th of January, some six days prior to the Stage 1 debate in this Parliament. Barnet consequentials amounting to an additional £148 million, pounds, presiding oh. officer. Now, no doubt when Patrick Harvey and the Green Party negotiated an extra, nine, an extra £90 million pounds for local government, they thought they were getting a good deal. Little did they know, I suspect, that Mr Mackay was holding back another £54 million pounds to put into the Scotland Reserve. It doesn't say much for the Green Party's negotiating skills, but it says even less about the transparency of the Scottish Government's budget process. They get an extra 148 million thanks to the UK Conservative Government, but they keep that information to themselves. Mr. Harvey will tell us whether he knew about this extra 54 million pounds or not. Patrick Harvey. I am very well aware, just as Murdo Fraser is very well aware, that this is not being simply put into the reserve. It is being used to move it from one financial year to the next in order that a teacher pay settlement, a much needed teacher pay settlement, will be funded nationally. Is Murdo Fraser saying that the Scottish Government should not be funding that teacher pay settlement? Murdo Fraser. Mr. Harvey couldn't answer my very simple question. Did he know about this extra money or not? He didn't answer that question. Presiding officer, the lack of transparency in the budget has also been criticised by one of the SNP's own economic advisers. The economist Richard Marsh, a member of the Scottish Government expert group advising on economic modelling and statistics, and also a researcher for the SNP's Sustainable Growth Commission, has gone so far as to report the Scottish Government to the UK statistics watchdog, yep. saying that the budget presented confusing data which buried key facts. He said, he said that, that strict clarity guidelines had been breached for political reasons and that figures and that figures in their budget were misleading. The numbers in the Scottish Budget Report, he said, were, and I quote, arranged in a way to persuade the reader of the merits of the Scottish Government's narrative around the budget. Presiding officer, it is time that the Finance Secretary reflects on the way that his budget information is presented to Parliament when even his own government's yep. advisers are criticising the way it puts forward. And I would say to him too, if he really wants the opposition parties to engage seriously on the budget in future. He needs to stop his practice of getting extra money and not telling Parliament about it as he should. But, presiding officer, it isn't just in terms of transparency that this budget has been criticised. The growing income tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the UK, breaking an SNP manifesto pledge, has been attacked by business organisations. The CBI in Scotland warning 
the divergence in income tax will be a major issue for companies keen to attract the best talent. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce warning it could take years to repair the damage of higher taxes and the Federation of Small Business in Scotland saying that the tax changes in the budget will erode the small business community's trust. But the greatest criticism of this budget has come in relation to the ludicrous plans for a new car park tax, a tax on which we have virtually no detail despite being asked to vote upon this budget package in a couple of hours' time. A tax which could cost workers £500 a year. A tax which will be regressive and hit the poorest hardest. And a tax on which there has been, by the Finance Secretary's own admission, no economic analysis done. <laughs> Presiding officer, the Scottish Government have claimed that this is a localist policy, a localist policy. But they have, they have taken the decision centrally to exempt NHS buildings. But not all NHS workers are employed in NHS buildings. As we previously pointed out, GP practices will employ large numbers of staff but are not classified as NHS properties. Yesterday, when asked about this in the Chamber, the Health Secretary didn't even seem to know what the policy was, saying that NHS workers would be exempt, directly contradicting the Finance Secretary's position. In this shambolic government, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. I'll give way to any member of the SNP front branch who can tell me are GP buildings exempt or not? No answer. They don't have a clue about their own policy. Oh, Mr. Mason. Well, we are elevating Mr. Mason to the government front bench, not before time, presiding officer. Mr. Mason. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way in his compliments. The answer is we have not yet started the process. The, listen. The rural. The Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee Order, let's hear the question, will be please. doing let's a hear consultation the question, please. and it will be this Parliament, not the Government, that makes the decision. Yeah, well done. Fraser. Well, I'm not sure Mr Mason will get promoted that quickly on the basis <laughs> of that uh, intervention, but I, 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 I applaud his valiant attempt for stepping in with his front bench failed to, because yesterday Gene Freeman, who I'm not sure if Gene Freeman's here, Gene Freeman told us GP practices would be exempt. Yeah. And now Mr Mason is telling us that they don't know the answer to that, so they need to make up their minds. And if NHS buildings are exempt, why not local government workers? Why not teachers? Why not social workers? Why not police officers? Why not emergency service workers? And for that matter, why not those in the private sector who may well be on lower pay than their public sector equivalents? Presiding officer, the First Minister was suggesting at the weekend that councils could rule out the car park tax and protect their local residents. But that completely misses the point. There are tens of thousands of workers who commute every day in their cars from one council area to another. Presiding officer, today every council group leader in Scotland, every Conservative council group leader in Scotland has pledged not to increase the car park tax. It is time the SNP did the same. But already we see SNP-led councils like Edinburgh and like Glasgow, First Minister, talking about introducing this charge. And in Edinburgh, Adding McVeigh has suggested the council leader, they should be paid not by employers, but by employees. The employees should pay. Does Mr Mackay agree with Adam McVeigh on that point? Cabinet Secretary. The intervention is meant to be where I ask the question and, and Mr Fraser answers it. The, uh, the question is this. Do those... Do those... Uh, do those Conservatives who are against the workplace parking levy are also the same Conservatives that come and visit me demanding the power over local discretionary taxes so that local government can make decisions for themselves. Murder Fraser. Presiding officer, I don't blame local councils across Scotland who have had their budget slashed by this finance secretary to go to his door and complain about that fact, presiding officer. Now, we know there are even those within the SNP who have complained about this regressive tax. John Swinney warned previously a workplace parking levy would lead to people simply parking their cars in nearby residential areas. Yeah. He was right to do so. Yeah. Both, both Bruce Crawford and Fergus Ewing are on record opposing these plans in the past. And much more recently, let's not forget, Richard Lyle told this Parliament, and I quote, I am not for your parking charge levy, and I speak on behalf of thousands of motorists who have been taxed enough. There speaks the voice of reason on the SNP backbenches. It's time government ministers started listening to him. Presiding officer, in reality, there was no need for these tax increases. 
This was a budget where the Scottish Government had more money from Westminster, a block grant increasing in real terms based on £520 million as against last year, according to Spice. And also according to Spice, the Scottish Government's overall budget is up in real terms compared to when the Conservatives first came to power in 2010. Not that you think it listening to the SNP. And yet this budget delivers not just tax hikes, it delivers a, a slashing of the core grant to local government, according to Spice, some £230 million in real terms. And we see that in our local papers every day this week, as councils across Scotland set their budgets, having to reduce teacher numbers, cut the length of the school week, lay off school crossing patrollers, close libraries, close leisure centres, making cuts in the real services that people in Scotland may depend upon. The Finance Secretary may be in denial these things are happening, but they are happening on his watch, and he has to take responsibility for them. I'm sorry, I would give way. I'm in the last minute. Presiding officer, what we should have had is a budget that focused on growing the economy, because growing the economy increases our tax revenues. Every 20 new additional rate taxpayers we attract to Scotland generates at least a million pounds in extra revenue. An extra 2,000 additional rate taxpayers would give us a minimum of 100 million pounds annually extra to spend on public services. A 1% increase in Scottish productivity would deliver 2.3 billion extra in GDP and 400 million pounds in tax revenue. That's the way we get more money for public services, with an expanding economy and rising wages. And what a pity that instead of going in that direction, we have an SNP government that would rather hike up taxes for working families, penalise the poorest with a regressive car park tax, and at the same time slash our local public services. Presiding officer, this parliament should tonight, at decision time, reject this omni-shambles budget. Thank you. And I call James Kelly to open for the Labour Party. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour will oppose this budget. The SNP have ignored the calls for a fair budget, awarded tax cuts to high earners, imposed cuts in councils that will reduce jobs, close services and hit vulnerable people hardest. The debate over council funding has been central to the budget process. The Cabinet Secretary and SNP MSPs are kidding themselves on if they think that there aren't going to be any cuts in council services. The reality is there are £230 million yes. of cuts across the country. And we can trade the figures back and forward. The real test is when you actually look at the sort of decisions that councils are considering on the ground. Yeah. So if you take Dundee, for example, where there's going to be a £3 million cut in education services, and that will include a reduction in teaching posts of 26. What does that say about education supposedly being the number one priority of this, of this government? In Clackmannanshire, the, the funding to the Citizens Advice Bureau faces been closed down and also uh, support for food bank for food banks being reduced so vulnerable people are going to be hit in that area and then Murray services are going to be slashed including library services and the proposed closure of uh, swimming pools so the reality of this budget is you've got cuts cuts and cuts all over the country that's what's happening Presiding officer, no thank you. Presiding officer, child poverty is a, is a scandal that stains modern Scotland. 230,000 kids. Yes, sure. Secretary, uh, would James Kelly like to explain at this point to fund the many commitments I'm sure he's about to, to list uh, what the headline tax rates would be under a Labour government in devolved Scotland? James Kelly. Under the under your proposals, Mr Mackay. <laughs> oh, just listen. Just listen. Just listen. Under your proposals, Mr Mackay, a lawyer, a lawyer on £90,000 will pay less tax. A chartered accountant on £100,000 will pay less tax. A chief executive on £120,000 will pay less tax. And that's why you've got workers in the streets of Dundee demonstrating because they fear the loss of their jobs. 
What Labour would, what Labour would propose is a top rate of tax of 50 pence, something the SNP previously supported but then stepped back from. We would also, we would also extend tax being raised in the higher band. That would raise a significant amount that would mitigate that would mitigate the crisis that we see in the country and, address, and address issues like child poverty. But it's something that should shame every MSP in this chamber that there are some kids in the country leaving for school in the morning who haven't had a proper breakfast. That is, a, that is an absolute scandal. That's why Labour proposed raising child benefit by five pounds. That was supported by charities and churches. And it was even given some support by Kevin Pringle in the Sunday Times, someone who carries some weight with SNP MSPs. The government also failed uh, in terms of mitigating the two-child cap. This is a horrendous Tory policy being imposed from Westminster, but we had an opportunity in this parliament to do things differently, and, it, and we've failed. Presiding officer on rail services, passengers continue to suffer delayed trains and cancelled trains. And we see only today that the performance figures for ScotRail have plummeted to the lowest level ever. That's why uh, Scottish Labour demanded a fares freeze, another demand ignored by the Scottish Government. And it's time they started listening to the concerns of rail passengers. Yeah. Strip a belly of the contract, yeah. give us a fares freeze yeah. and a publicly owned <laughs> railway. One of the changes from the first stage of the budget was the, the, the introduction of the, the proposal for the workplace parking levy. Uh, this is clearly a flawed proposal. First of all, in no way, in no way, uh, I'll take an intervention from... John Mr. Finney. I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention on that point. Uh, was it a flawed policy when his colleagues promoted it in both their Glasgow and Edinburgh local authority election manifesto? James Kelly. As, as the Unite and GMB trade unions have pointed out in recent days, any... Any... Any tax... Any tax that imposes, any proposal that imposes a tax on workers as they take their car to work is an unfair tax and it will be, and it will be opposed, and it will be opposed, and it will be opposed. No, thank you. No, th on you go. First Minister. <laughs> James Kelly didn't answer John Finney's question. I wonder if he will do so now. If it's such a bad policy, why did Labour propose it in their manifestos in Edinburgh and in Glasgow? It's a simple question. Let's have an answer. James Kelly. As the First, as the first Minister will be aware, your government has carried out no... No... Your government has carried out no economic assessment of this policy. You're proposing, you're proposing to bring it forward at stage two of the transport bill, and therefore limiting any proper, any proper scrutiny of the policy. It is a flawed policy, and it will be rejected by workers across, uh, across Scotland. Presiding officer, what we needed... What we needed in this chamber was a budget that used fair taxation to stop the, stop the cuts and tackle poverty and inequality. And what we got was a budget that will cause crisis in Scotland's communities. This budget lets people down and we will oppose it at 5pm. Thank you. And I call on Patrick Harvey to open for the Green Party. Presiding officer. Just a few weeks ago, uh, I took part in a public meeting in Deniston at the Whitehill uh, School, which was uh, debating with people from the Labour Party, the SNP, the Conservatives, and a great many people in the community debating the impact on the, their community uh, if their pool was closed, as community centres and leisure centres across that city were all threatened. 
we all know the scale of what was under consideration before the budget agreement that secured not only new money but new flexibility for local councils. Well, today, my colleagues on Glasgow City Council, as they debate their budget this afternoon, are able to put forward a balanced budget proposal that involves saving all libraries, all sports facilities and community centres, protecting budgets for schools, including for additional support for the children who need it most uh, in just a moment. And indeed, new measures such as a climate emergency fund to save money through energy saving and cutting waste and investing in renewable energy, Glasgow Crossrail and active travel. Things that would not be possible were it not for the agreement that we've reached. I've got time for one intervention. I'll give way to Mr Neil Finley. Finley. Um, is the Cabinet Secretary telling the truth when he says that there are no cuts to any Council's budget given the deal that the Greens and the SNP have struck? And if so, why are councils from Shetland to, to, to Dumfries debating lists of cuts that are as thick as you can find uh, in every council across the country? If there's no cuts to be found, then tell us why they're doing that. Patrick Mr. Harvey. I am, I am certainly not accountable for the words of the Cabinet Secretary. But I will say, I will say to Mr Finlay, as I have said before, if he's willing to listen to the answer, I've said to him uh, before, I've not pretended that this results in a perfect budget. We know that councils are facing rising demand for services, inflation costs, and indeed in places like Glasgow, the cost of an historic decades-long failure by the previous administration to meet the equal pay bill for councils. But in, in Glasgow... In Glasgow and indeed in Edinburgh, where my colleagues Let's are putting forward a budget in Edinburgh which boosts care for older people by nine million, uh, an 80 million pound drive to a new programme uh, of new high schools, and also putting forward some of the same measures on the climate emergency. Councils across Scotland are in a far stronger position to meet those challenges they face as a result of the work they've done. I won't pretend that it solves uh, every problem. But I do say it's a vast improvement and I do say again to all political parties that this process would only have been better if every political party in here had engaged positively and put forward proper, constructive, costed proposals as the Greens tried to do. Presiding officer, I want to say something about the workplace parking levy. The, the reaction to this would be funny if it wasn't so dismal. This is a proposal legislated for down south by a Labour government, used by a Labour council, proposed by Scottish Labour councillors, supported by Lib Dem MSPs and councillors in the past, voted for by Tory councillors in the past. The fact that they've decided that this is an intolerable policy when we propose it, but not when they proposed it, is simply a mark of shameless political opportunism. And coming in a week, coming in a week, after young people across Scotland and the world have taken radical action themselves to demand urgent responses on air pollution and on climate change, some people appear to be losing the plot over something uh, as, as trivial uh, as this policy. This is not even in. Yes, indeed. Presiding officer, this policy, the workplace parking levy, isn't even in this budget. And I'll tell you this, it'll never be in a Scottish budget because this is about giving powers to councils where they decide, where local decision makers decide that it's in the local interest. I want to finish, presiding officer, with one appeal across the whole political spectrum. We now have the opportunity to do something radical to decentralise fiscal power in this country, something this parliament should have done much earlier in its 20-year history. We've got the opportunity to start devolving non-domestic rate reliefs. We've got the opportunity to give new tax powers and new environmental levy powers to councils. And we've got the opportunity, finally, if all political parties take it, to scrap the broken, unfair council tax which creates so much injustice in our society. I only hope that all politicians will step up to that opportunity and make sure that we get better improvements year on year as a result of the changes we've negotiated in this year. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Willie Rennie to open for the Liberal Democrats. This is shaping up to be the worst of Scottish budgets. You can tell... 
You can tell the SNP agree. Their MSPs have spent so much of the last fortnight talking about which bits of the budget they do not support. In stage one debate, I said that Patrick Harvey had sold out local government for the vice convenership of the Car Park Working Group. But I may have spoken too soon. The entire SNP has run a mile from the proposal, so it looks like Patrick Harvey is going to be doing this all by himself. The SNP have lost any pretense of financial competence. I'm yet to see any evidence that the tax change implemented last year has driven people out of the country. But the tax burden has to be managed with care, as we don't want to see falling revenues as a result of adverse behavioural change. Yet I think the SNP has lost its senses. Their record is now five new taxes, none of which were in the SNP manifesto, and two broken tax promises in just one year. If people think that taxes will rise at every budget and over a range of areas, this country will get a reputation for being high tax, and we may see the result in falling tax revenues. The Greens have been bought very cheaply. It turns out the extra money for councils was already available. There were £123 million of October consequentials, £148 million of January consequentials, hundreds of millions of underspend this year, plus the hundreds of millions of underspend next year that this government's track record all but guarantees, plus increased tax receipts from the public sector pay increases, and £54 billion put into reserves. The Greens didn't get all the money that was available. And the Greens said to councils, we have closed your £237 million funding gap with £90 million cash and permission, permission to cut adult social care by £50 million. Quite astonishing. Then they said they don't expect councils to cut the social care, but they still closed the gap. It never added up, and it's a clear trick. And local government finance reform has been delayed until the next parliament. The next parliament. Yet more talks on top of all the other talks that we've had that have amounted to absolutely nothing. <laughs> Not just now. On council tax, the Greens used to say that the council tax was unfair. So unfair that they want it to go up this year and become even more unfair. On the parking levy, the inventor of the plan, John Finney, tweeted the wrong information about the Nottingham scheme. He said you only paid for the 11th car parking space. Not true. You pay for all 11. So this budget is a list of policies they do not understand, of cuts they can't hide, of taxes they are putting up when they promised they would go down. What a budget this is turning out to be. But we couldn't. It could, of course it could, have been different. We offered to work with the SNP. We've done it before. In previous years, we voted for the budget. They remember we voted for the budget when we secured extra support for early education and childcare, despite their opposition, for colleges, despite their opposition, for school meals. So we have been prepared to work with the SNP. But with the First Minister travelling the world to tell all about her plans to break up the United Kingdom in the wake up of the breakup of the European Union, it's no surprise that we might be just a little bit concerned. So there is no way we could support a budget of a government determined to drive forward yet another divisive independence referendum. We asked for a cessation so we could work together on this budget. But they could not even agree to a short cessation. Such is their obsession. We have successfully harried the government to invest in mental health services. But the government are now playing catch-up. And we remain unconvinced that the funds announced will feed through to real change quickly enough. Last year, we said mental health spend should rise to a total of £1.2 billion. But a year later, it is still £100 million short. That's £100 million for new health professionals in the NHS, in schools 
and the police. We needed a budget that put teachers at the very centre of our developing economy in the years to come. And a proper and fair deal for local government was important too. So this year, we could have worked together on the needs of local government, on the funding of mental health and the support for teachers. But Derek Mackay, Mackay declined. I am sure the Finance Secretary will be taking down his Catalan flag from his flagpole in Renfrew this weekend. It turns out the Catalan pro-independence parties have insisted on a dialogue over independence as a price for them supporting the Spanish government. Who says we're not allowed to put independence and the constitution at the heart of the budget debate? We will not support a Scottish government that will use this budget as a stepping stone to independence and the economic damage that would bring. This budget could have been very different if it were not for the one-track mind of the SNP and their sidekicks at the Greens. Thank you very much. And we turn now to the open part of the debate and I call Angela Constance to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Angela Constance. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, after the Stage 1 debate a few weeks ago, I had hoped that Chamber would be in a more uh, mature, uh, reflective mood today, prepared uh, to really discuss and indeed debate the, the big budget issues of the day on how best to, to grow our economy and how to make Scotland fairer. And I know that I, for one, won't be quoting poetry at Mr Mackay because He's the only man I know that if a woman quotes Tam a Shanter at him, he takes it as a compliment. Um, instead, what we've heard uh, over the past uh, few weeks is a, a real heavy dose of hysteria. Hysteria about 32 local authorities in Scotland getting the same powers uh, with, along with 32, 30, 326, I beg your pardon, local authorities in England uh, in relation to workplace parking. And despite having this power since 2000, and despite local government in England suffering a 17% real terms reduction to their budget in the last four years, only Nottingham City Council have used this uh, local power. But of course, Tories and others won't let the facts uh, get in the way of some good old fashioned uh, scaremongering. Uh, because what their campaign is actually about, it's about reducing the debate about a £42 billion budget to the lowest common denominator. What their tactics are really about is diminishing debates in our parliament to that of a parish council in an episode of the Vicar of Dibley. Because what we should be debating, presiding officer, is where power lies and what other decisions should be made at a local level and how we can improve local democracy and local accountability. And with 36 days to, to Brexit, we have heard all the faux outrage about how dare the First Minister put a foot outside Scotland eh, to represent our future economic interests when we run the risk eh, of having our GDP eh, falling by seven percentage points. This is playground politics eh, at its best, eh, at its worst. It's a, a poverty of aspiration. And I've listened very carefully to what the Tories and others have eh, said about taxation, but what really interests me is that you never hear the Conservatives bemoan the fact that Scottish taxpayers actually pay twice to insulate the most vulnerable in their society from the harshest of Tory welfare austerity. Our citizens pay for both the Scottish and UK social security systems and they have the right to expect fairness, dignity and respect from both governments. And Labour, as we've heard today, uh, are continuing to advocate for a £5 increase in the... Yeah, sure. Neil Finlay. Policy. I think the harshest is indeed the two-child cap. Isn't it regrettable that we're not take, taking action in this budget to eradicate it? Angela, oh, Angela yeah, Constance. Angela, Angela, there's a very serious point uh, about the role of mitigation, and I do want to get on uh, to that point that Mr uh, Finlay raises, although I do regret that the Labour Party have not produced uh, a costed alternative budget uh, about how best we use uh, our resources and powers in this place. The Labour Party, as we've heard, uh, advocate a £5 increase in the near universal child benefit. Uh, I, on the other hand, would rather give an extra £10 to £20 to the children most in need. 
And by doing that, according to the IPPR, we would lift 40,000 children out of poverty, as opposed to 10 to 15,000 uh, children. But the challenge to Labour and the challenge for folk like me as well is where do we get that quarter of a billion pounds that it would cost annually to do that? That's a challenge for me and you as well as the government. And can we please start to lift this debate about how we actually get Wains out of poverty as opposed to confining our horizons to mitigation. Mitigation prevents a step backwards, but it doesn't enable a step forward. And what we in this parliament need to start recognising is that mitigation comes at a cost. And the UN Raconteur on Extreme Poverty, eh, not a man who minces words, said that mitigation comes at a price and is not sustainable. And frankly, it is outrageous that one government has to use its resources to protect its citizens against the actions of another government. And therefore, <laughs> therefore, design officer, I for one, I for one, will always argue for more powers for this parliament. And Mr Rennie, I for one will always be a campaigner for independence. But I will not, however, ever demure from the debate about how best we use the powers and resources that we currently have available. I will never shirk from the debate or the hard work of building consensus about the best ways to grow our economy and make Scotland fairer. Because the questions of the day are not about car parking charges. They're about how we reform our public services, recognising that resources are never infinite, but needs always are. How we ensure that this generation of young people are not the first to be worse off than their parents. How we welcome new Scots from the EU and beyond. How we pay for the social democracy that we want. How we end poverty. How we, for the sake of our economy, step out of the short-term political cycle and have the courage and guts to plan and invest for the long term. That's what a budget debate in this parliament should be about. And the budget process is for grown-ups. It's about finding the basis of agreement in these difficult times to provide stability. Uh, that, at the end of the day, is what we're all elected to do, and it's what the country rightly expects us to do. Thank you, Ms. Constance. I call Dean Lockhart. We're followed by Tom Arthur. Mr. Lockhart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In the rate resolution debate earlier this week, the SNP declared that their tax proposals are based on the key principles of being progressive and protecting low-paid low workers, raising additional government revenue and supporting the economy. But as always, once you look beyond the SNP spin, it becomes clear that this budget delivers on none of those so-called principles. The reality is this, this budget is regressive and will only serve to penalise low-paid workers in Scotland. Everyone earning £27,000 or more will have a lower take-home pay than their friends and colleagues in the rest of the UK. These are ordinary, hard-working people, nurses, police officers and teachers who are now having to pay for the SNP's high-tax, low-growth agenda. This budget also delivers higher council tax bills for low-income households across Scotland, with many families facing an increase of more than £500 a year. But worst of all, this budget introduces a new tax the car park tax, which could cost low-paid workers an extra £500 a year. Organisations across Scotland have rightly warned that this is a deeply unpopular and regressive tax. It is not based on the ability to pay, and it will hit the lowest-paid workers the most. I, I will in a second. I would just like to highlight to John Mason that yesterday Unite warned the SNP that this tax will penalise workers just for turning up to work. And the Scottish Food and Drink Federation has warned that full-time workers on lower level wages would fall below the national living wage if they have to pay this cart park tax. I'll give way to John Mason. John Mason. I thank Mr Lockhart for giving way. Would you at least accept that the parking levy is not in the budget in the first place? And secondly, that it still has to go through its parliamentary process and we will examine all the details of it. Dean Lockhart. Oh, Mr. Mason, you should know that uh, your party has agreed with the Greens as part of the budget negotiation process for this unfair tax. <laughs> Presiding officer, if the SNP think that increasing the tax burden on low and middle earners, increasing council tax bills and imposing a tax on workers for parking their car at work is fair, progressive and protecting low-paid workers, then they are clearly out of touch with the hard-working people of Scotland. The SNP has also declared that this budget will raise additional government revenues to support public services. 
Now, it's true that increasing the tax gap with the rest of the UK will in itself raise £68 million in revenue for this uh, next current financial year. But this has to be seen in the context of total forecast income tax revenues for next year being revised downwards by the SFC by £660 million. Now that Scottish income tax is under the control of the SNP, we are now seeing the real negative budgetary consequences of Scotland's economy growing at just half the rate of the rest of the UK. The Fraser of Allender, let me make a bit of progress, and I will. The Fraser of Allender has made it clear the new fiscal framework puts an explicit burden on the Scottish Government to secure growth rates at least equal to the rest of the UK. The Fraser of Allender goes on to say that if Scottish income tax revenues grow just one third of a percent slower than UK levels, the Scottish budget will be short by £250 million. But that's exactly what is being forecast by the SFC and the OBR. Slower income tax revenue growth in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK, which will significantly reduce the budget available for public spending in Scotland. I'll give way if the member wants to... Kate Forbes. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. The member will, of course, then welcome the fact that the Scottish economy grew faster than the UK as a whole last year. And does he accept of what is his opinion on whether Brexit will help us to grow the economy or hinder that? Dean Lockhart. Well, for nine of the last 11 years the SNP has been powered, the Scottish economy has grown slower than the rest of the UK, and the SFC is forecasting five more years of stagnation under the SNP. So I think that's the answer to your question. Now, President Officer, the budget will only make this worse by increasing the tax gap with the rest of the UK. The Chartered Institute of Taxation has warned taxpayers will now take steps to relocate away from Scotland or incorporate their business and take themselves out of Scotland's tax base. So the Finance Secretary has to recognise that under the fiscal framework, the priority must be to increase Scotland's tax revenues relative to the rest of the UK. But this budget does precisely the opposite and will create a vicious cycle of ever higher taxes having to be imposed on a declining tax base in Scotland. Presiding officer, the SNP has also claimed <laughs> that its tax policy will support Scotland's economy. Every leading business organisation in Scotland disagrees. Yeah. The CBI has warned that Scottish business will be unable to compete with rivals across the UK in the event of further divergence of tax rates. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce has told the SNP the sooner politicians realise that supporting economic growth rather than hiking up taxes is the route towards increasing revenues, the quicker Scotland will prosper. And the Federation of Small Business has told the SNP that their latest tax increases will erode the trust of the small business community. We have a straight choice here. We can either believe the SNP that higher taxes will grow the economy, or we can believe every leading business organisation in Scotland that higher taxes will damage economic growth. I think it's clear which side of the argument is correct. Presiding officer, after 11 years of SNP government, we are already seeing the longest period of low growth in Scotland for 60 years. This budget will only cause further damage to Scotland's economy as forecast by the SFC. By introducing the deeply regressive car park tax, this budget also shows the people of Scotland that this is a tired government, a government out of ideas. I'm about Members to wrap in his up. last minute. A tired government, a government out of ideas, out of touch, and fast running out of time. And that's why we will be voting against the budget at decision time today. Thank you. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Polly McNeill. Mr. Arthur, please. Thank you very much. Presiding officer, it's an honour to have the opportunity to contribute to this stage three budget debate. And I would like to begin by highlighting one single budget line I am delighted to see <coughs> contained. And that's the £180 million towards the attainment challenge and £120 million to go direct towards head teachers. I'm sure the whole chamber will join me in congratulating the outstanding work of teachers, staff, pupils and parents in Renfrewshire and Renfrewshire Council officials as well on their achievement this week. Significant year-on-year -year improvements in listening, talking, reading, writing and numeracy with the attainment gap closing across all measures. In Renfrewshire, an area where we have some incredibly challenging circumstances for some of our young people, this is a, an achievement I think we should be incredibly proud of teachers and pupils and staff in Renfrewshire, and I hope the Parliament will show its appreciation. <laughs> I think what has characterised much of this debate has been um, a great deal of heat, but not a great deal of light. And it's been remarked by many that we are marking the 20th anniversary of devolution, and 
which the promise was of a new kind of politics, a new kind of a parliament, a parliament where the, the architects of our uh, electoral system envisaged that all parties would have to work together and to collaborate, and no more. Uh, and this would be no more um, necessary, no more other area than in setting a budget for the parliament. But unfortunately, a lot of the debate doesn't seem to, I think, be her much of standing when um, confronted with reality. Now, there was, in the previous contribution, Dean Lockhart spoke about the different rates of growth between Scotland and the rest of the UK, and he quoted SFC figures, and he's perfectly entitled to do so. But I think we need to drill down a bit further. For example, if we look at the GDP per person differential between Scotland and the rest of the UK, it narrows. But if we look at the per capita working age GDP between Scotland and the rest of the UK, the difference in the forecast of the SFC ch disappears completely. Now, why would this be the case? Well, it's a demographic issue. We have an older, older population, and so we face a, a, a significant challenge in growing our population so that we can fund our public services. And this is something that is going to be made incredibly difficult by Brexit. And yes, there are challenges for the Scottish Government, there are challenges for us in this Parliament in continuing to make Scotland an attractive place. But when we have a Prime Minister who is Home Secretary, who is architect of the hostile environment, a Prime Minister whose cabinet, former Cabinet colleague stated in national television last night that she believes the Prime Minister to have an immigration problem, then that is deeply concerning. And indeed, as Angela Constance mentioned, mitigation may be able to stop us taking a step back, but we will never be able to take a step forward when powers over immigration are held in London and are exercised by someone with the views and values of the Prime Minister. Another key area in t with regards to growing our economy, of course, is productivity. And it is a challenge that has received much commentary, both within this Parliament and by many thinkers out with. If I may, with your permission, President Officer, I wish to quote from a recent article in the Respected Society Now, the Economic and Social Research Council's journal. And it's um, from a, a Mr. Um, a Professor Philip McCann, who is a professor of urban and regional economics at the University of Sheffield. And he made some interesting remarks regarding productivity in the UK. He stated that the first and most striking difference between the, this is how his remarks were reported, the first and most striking difference between the UK and other nations, says McCann, is a massive variation in economic productivity between its regions and nations. These different levels of productivity in turn drive levels of affluence and influence social conditions and are regarded as a key determinant of economic success. McCann's message is that the, amongst the industrial economies, the UK has some of the world's biggest inter-regional differences in productivity. He, he has an examples to make the point. On some measures, the UK has bigger productivity variations than the whole of the Eurozone. It has regions that are less productive than many parts of the Czech Republic, Slovakia, the Baltic states, and the former East Germany. And almost half of the UK population today lives in areas that are poorer than West Virginia or Mississippi in the US, where British TV companies go to make documentaries about poverty. To suggest that somehow the challenge in productivity it's exclusively an issue for Scotland and exclusively an issue for the Scottish Government. It's not something that stacks up. And I think we have to be a bit mature, more mature in how we discuss productivity and a range of other measures. And I think there's, there's much else that he adds, but I think something is very worth while bearing in mind is when he articulates um, regarding these variations within the UK, he states, the higher productivity areas, he says, include London and a wide swathe of the southeast, the east and parts of the southwest of England as well as Scotland. And he then goes on in this article to go and praise the work of the Scottish Parliament and how it's enabled a more data-driven approach. And he highlights how actually smaller territorial units of around about 4.5 million are able to address issues of productivity far more effectively. So I think these are some of the things we have to take on board. We can come into the chamber, and I'm as guilty of it as the next person, and we can engage in cheap politics and exchange blows and get progressively more irascible as a debate progresses. But that's ultimately not going to make a difference for the people we are sent here to represent. What does make a difference for the people we are sent here, sent, we are sent here to represent is the money in the attainment challenge. The money is going to go into schools in my constituency. The money that's enabling head teachers like Jackie McBurney in St Anthony's 
in Johnston to go and deliver such outstanding results as to become the first Scottish school to receive the UK Literacy School Award. So I hope that in next year's budget and that the conversations about next year's budgets can start imminently, that we can take a more mature mm. and constructive approach you must conclude. and live up to the aspirations that the architects of devolution have Thank for you. this place. Thank you. I call Polly McNeill, followed by Keith Brown. There are some things in the budget I agree with, the introduction of a new Best Start grant for low-income families and the widening criteria for funeral expenses, the care of supplement, though it could be better still. But on the whole, the budget does not meet Scotland's challenges to protect public services. Scottish Labour will oppose this budget as it stands. We believe it further entrenches austerity in our communities and will much deeper cuts to our public services. The pressure on local authorities have never been greater and services so acute. I don't really remember a time where local authorities, local authorities were more hard pressed on funds and where communities face cuts in basic services where you have head teachers writing to parents about unprecedented cuts. Life is hard for many people struggling to make ends meet, utterly shafted by a decade of wage stagnation, rising prices and job insecurity. One in four children in Scotland lives in poverty and the government has repeatedly rejected the calls of Labour and a broad range of the third sector, including Child Poverty Action Group, to top up child benefit to lift children out of poverty. Meanwhile, we remain in the dark about what the proposed income supplement will look like and the analysis by the Fraser of Allender shows that 0.1% of the Scottish budget is targeted at low-income families with children. The effects of child poverty discussed in this parliament on many occasions should not be underestimated. Children from higher income families significantly outperform those from low income households at ages three and five. And by five, there is a gap of 10 months in problem solving development and of 13 months in vocabulary. Three year olds in households with incomes below 10,000 pounds are two and a half times more likely to suffer chronic illness than children in other households. So as well as being harmful to children and families, child poverty has a wider cost to society. A 2013 study estimates that the high levels of child poverty in the UK are currently costing the country at least 29 billion a year. And this includes the policy interventions and long-term losses to the economy, lower educational attainment, poorer mental health and physical health. The Labour analysis shows that a top-up of £5 a week could benefit a total of over 270,000 families across the country who would see their household income topped by at least £520 a year. It is wrong to say that income does not matter to low-income families. Hard cash makes a difference. If you want the evidence, look at the Labour government's introduction of working tax credits in 2010, which has lifted tens of thousands out of poverty. So don't tell me hard cash does not matter. It does. So I want to say a few uh, words uh, on the tax on work. In a moment of complete madness, in my opinion, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance offered the Green Party the prospect of powers to devolve and introduce a workplace levy on car parking without any consideration of the detail or who it would affect or indeed what the objectives. I will take an intervention if you just let me make a few more points. I'll be happy to do that. Um, a deal, a part of the deal is to legislate from this and so far, I have not heard one word in defence of this substantial case for this levy. All I've heard is who said what to who. Well, frankly, I am not interested in that. This Labour group here are opposed to the devolution of working tax debt. We are opposed to this, and I am personally immovable on this. There is zero understanding. I will in a minute, because there is zero understanding. If you think that this is a real prospect for working families, 44% of adults who do not pay income tax because they earn less than 12 and a half thousand. Cabinet Secretary, far from scaremongering, why would you risk a policy that will tax people to go to work? I will take your intervention. Before, before this <clears throat> happens, can I remind members not to use the term you, you must speak through the chair. 
Cabinet Secretary. Okay, my intervention was for some moments ago, but the point is this. I mean, actually, Labour and local government, you see the group here oppose that, but the Labour Party and local government is campaigning for these discretionary yeah. taxes. But my yeah. intervention was actually this. On the point of detail, to fund the commitments that Pauline McNeill is asking for, can Pauline McNeill tell me the detail from the Labour Party? How would they be funded? Absolutely. Ms McNeill. Well, rather, Cabinet Secretary, I think it's for you to tell us why you support this policy, which you seem reluctant to do. Because, uh, Cabinet Secretary, so let's take, this, let's take this argument a little bit further. There's already talk of exemptions, but not so far of exemptions for low-paid people or even Glasgow's large, Scotland's largest city who can still not get a reliable bus or train to work. It beggars belief that there are three pages in this budget devoted to public transport, but no revolution in the bus industry. In fact, you can't even make the trains run on time and no new... A child could see, no, a child could see that you would put investment in public transport first before you would consider a levy, and that is an indicator that this has not been thought through. You have already lost the argument. If you haven't seen it out there, I, I challenge the SNP and the Greens. Will you conduct a public consultation? See what the public think about a tax to work. Well, I am confident that the public will tell you where to go with it. In conclusion, presiding officer, light unite, light unison. I ask the Glasgow MSPs in this chamber, will you back this tax to work? Hands up all the Glasgow MSPs who are going to back this tax to work. Yeah, you're defending it. Not what single substantial one. The most centralising government to, uh, now all of a sudden believes that. Right, abandon it now. Stand it up down, for Ms. working McNeil. people. That's what you were elected it. to do. That's it. Your passion does you credit, but you still kept using the term you. I will be determined. Uh, Keith Brown, followed by Miles Briggs, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak in favour of the budget proposals of the Scottish Government, and I believe they show a progressive agenda being pursued by the Government, despite what is obviously one of the most financially difficult uh, backgrounds, caused by two things. First of all, the failed austerity agenda of the Conservatives and the complete economic failure of the previous uh, Labour Government. If you remember the legacy of the Labour Government, the last five words, there is no money left. That was Labour's uh, legacy. And it's interesting, it must be a difficult budget, because look at the action of the three parties other than the Greens, the opposition parties. The Tories don't want to be seriously part of this because they know that a half, million, five, a half billion pound tax cut and more spending for everything doesn't add up, so that's why they don't come up with a budget proposal. Labour, I think, is simply incapable of coming up with a budget proposal. And I actually was approached by a Labour councillor asking if I put an amendment to the budget, presumably because he felt he couldn't get an amendment past the Labour group in the first place. And then we come to the lonely figure of Willie Rennie who wants other, everyone else to give up on what they believe in in order to even have a discussion about the budget. Yeah. Even his former colleague, Margaret Smith, described that as bizarre and stupid. And that's why the Liberal Democrats have had no input into the budget at all. I spoke in the previous stage of the budget, and I made the point then that there is a very difficult national context given the austerity squeeze. And that has resulted in uh, a slashing of the Scottish budget by over £2 billion over the past decade by the Tory government. But I also mentioned the financial consequences of Labour and their disastrous PFI projects. Of course, that had the usual outcry from the Labour Party, desperate to avoid any responsibility for the size of the challenge faced by local authorities. Last year, the Labour debt legacy local government inherited was £434 million nationally. And thanks to contracts signed under the previous Labour executive in this place, these, dates, these debts will have to continue to be paid for decades to come. In Clipmanager, which was mentioned by both Richard Leonard earlier today and by James Kelly, three high schools were built because the Labour, Labour Party chose to go for PF. It's saddling Clipmanager Council with debts of around £8.5 million pounds this year. That is 17% of their education budget before they can spend a penny on schools. And I'll tell you this, neither the Citizens Advice Bureau nor the schools that were mentioned earlier on will close if it's anything to do with the SNP. Of course, I can't speak for the Labour Party. The situation in the Stirling Council, which I also represent, is little better. The debt repayments here total £11.7 million pounds last year. That's 14% of its entire education budget. So the reality of that legacy has to be faced 
by these councils as you try to set their budget. And it's taking a, a place against not just that background, but also against the background of failed Tory austerity and pernicious welfare and benefit reforms. Patrick Harvey mentioned earlier on the increasing demand, both on councils and on public services. And that is certainly helping, uh, uh, help, not helping things in my constituency. And unfortunately, this parliament does not yet have the powers to implement fairer policies right across the board, which have dignity, dignity and respect at their core. But what it can and does do is mitigate some of the worst excesses of the Tory welfare policies in order to provide relief for at least some of the appalling consequences of these unfair policies. And I'm happy now, if the Tory party MSPs want to listen into this part, to give way to any Conservative member that's willing to say that they are committed to the mitigation of the bedroom tax. I know they've clarified their position on the bedroom tax today by saying it doesn't exist. But if they want to come forward and say they support the mitigation for 70,000 families, up to £650 on average per year, support it now and support it beyond 2021, I'm more than happy to hear from them. Now, I think that silence is going to be greeted with real concern by people across Scotland, because that, to me, means this Tory tax, obviously supported by the Liberal Democrats when Willie Rennie's party was in office, this Tory tax and the absolute bunkum we've heard from Dean Locker expressing concern for hard-working poor families in Scotland on tax proposals, they're willing to take away that mitigation for the bedroom tax and impose this Tory tax, which apparently doesn't exist on the people of Scotland. That is a huge benefit, £30 million per year, 70,000 uh, fa uh, families. In addition to that, the benefits for carers, or Paul McNeil mentioned the Best Start Grant, is that going to go as well if the Tories get the chance to do that? These are the real things that affect people in Scotland. Angela Constance was quite right to say we don't have all the powers to deal with this and a sensible argument has to be undertaken about how you can properly address child poverty and rising poverty. And it has to be done in conjunction with a government at Westminster that's willing to play its part. And that's not happening just now. The bedroom tax uh, is appalling. I know it was first looked at and brought in by the, or at least considered by the Labour Party under Andrew Adonis. But it's been taken to new measures and it's a real bind for the people that are having to pay it. And it's perhaps not the tax that's most obvious because it's been mitigated, as First Minister said earlier today. So people sometimes are unaware of the fact. They'll certainly be aware of the fact that the Tory party wants to take away, as we see today, the mitigation that's there and fully impose that particular burden on families in Scotland. So will they support the people in Scotland? Or will they continue to support their London masters? And the absolute destruction, dissolution of Westminster that we've seen this week with people who at the start of the week were Labour MPs, some of whom were Tory MPs, sitting down shaking hands on the same benches. Not one of the Tory MSPs here has said what their view is on the view of those Tory MPs that have left, which said that the Tory party is in the grip of the ERG and the DUP and has abandoned every principle it has. They're willing to speak up about it. Not one single Tory MSP will speak up about the biggest threat to the welfare of families in Scotland, which is a hard Brexit or any Brexit at all. When are they going to find a spine to speak up for the people of Scotland? When are they going to find a spine to actually propose a proper, responsible amendment? In the member is just closing. I would like to have taken an intervention from... from I'm afraid from you must conclude. So, you must officer, conclude. I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to the debate and support Thank the Scottish Government's proposals. I call Miles Briggs, who followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In my time as an MSP, I've not seen such a negative reaction from members of the public to any budget proposal like I've seen to the SNP car tax. I know, now I know the First Minister hasn't had the opportunity to speak to many Scots recently, but I think it's important that in the coming weeks, SNP members and ministers actually start to listen to the growing concerns at the impact which the SNP car tax will have on businesses, on workers, on the economic attractiveness of our country. The Finance Secretary has, a, let me make some progress, the Finance Secretary has already admitted to this Parliament that there's been no consultation whatsoever on the proposed new tax. Not a great place for our councils when they're looking to take this forward. And as each day passes, SNP ministers seem to be digging themselves into ever deeper holes, deeper than some of the worst potholes on our roads. Nicola Sturgeon claimed that people who didn't live in areas where this tax is to be imposed, which now seems to be Scotland's major cities, would not be affected. That is just not true. Yes, very briefly. Cabinet Secretary. Miles Briggs for taking the intervention. When the draft budget was published, Miles Briggs welcomed many elements of the draft budget, including the extension of free personal care. Does Miles Briggs have any shame in voting against making the resources available to deliver the extension of free personal care? Miles Briggs. 
As Pauline McNeil, McNeil outlined, there's parts of this budget I welcome, but this is not a budget which is going to deliver anything for Scotland. The things which we force the government to do, I'll take credit for, but this isn't the budget which will help our country move forward. But the impact, and I, it was interesting that the Cabinet Secretary didn't want to talk about his car park tax, because hard-working families across my Lothian region are the ones who will pay the price. Many of my constituents who live in West, Mid and East Lothian drive to their work here in the capital and will be the very people affected. Car journeys from commuters and residents outside Edinburgh last year saw 12,381 commuters from West Lothian, 10,316 commuters from Mid Lothian and over 10,000 from East Lothian. Many people who live in West, Mid and East Lothian but who work here in the Edinburgh have looked to take advantage of cheaper house prices. Yes, very briefly. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm grateful to, to the member for giving away. Mr Briggs may be very happy to see that vast volume of traffic flooding into Edinburgh city centre every day. Does the Conservative Party have any proposals for actually tackling the pollution and climate change crisis which this kind of short-sighted, unsustainable approach to transport policy is causing? Miles Briggs. Mr Harvey, I think you summed up uh, this policy when you said this was a trivial policy. Yes. This is not a trivial policy. Yes. This will impact yes. on everyone in Scotland. This is an impact on people and their businesses. It will impact on our GPs, our care homes. This is the impact which you haven't explained. Maybe you didn't think through the policy. Maybe it wasn't yours. Maybe the Cabinet Secretary suggested it for votes. We don't know. But I'm proud to represent Edinburgh and Lothian. As our capital city, it remains a vibrant and successful city. But SNP ministers are increasingly risking that. Edinburgh in the South East has outperformed our Scottish economy last year and is actually performing still, the only part of our economy still growing. Now I know from speaking to businesses across my region that they increasingly feel this finance secretary and this government is taking the economy of the Lothians for granted. Now this Scottish government budget has demonstrated the increasing deficit in debt levels which this government's spending also is building up. Last year, for example, the deficit was over £13.4 billion, pounds, equivalent to 9.7% of our GDP, while the UK rate was at one9 Scottish Government debt has hit £1.5 billion pounds this year, as SNP ministers borrow the very maximum on the nation's credit card. Deputy Presiding Officer, it used to be said that as night follows day, the fundamental truth of any Labour government was that it eventually ran out of other people's money. But it now seems that the SNP finance minister have joined the same club. No, I've only got two minutes left, having taken uh, three interventions from SNP members and Patrick Harvey, which is maybe the same thing. <laughs> Deputy <laughs> presiding officer, the fundamental fact of this SNP green budget is it will hit small town Scotland. Hard-working Scots who play by the rules, work hard and who are trying to get on in life and build a better life and future for them and their families. Yeah. Deputy Presiding Officer, my colleague Murdo Fraser famously last year lamented the deal struck uh, by the Finance Secretary and the Greens in this Parliament when he somewhat cruelly said uh, to Derek Mackay that he'd done a deal with the lentil munching, sandal wearing watermelons. <laughs> well, looking at this budget in the round, what is clear is in the last few weeks we have seen that this SNP Green budget, the lentils have fermented, the sandals have snapped and the watermelon in it is truly rotten. Deputy Presiding Officer, we had an opportunity with this budget to deliver a budget for jobs and growth for our country, for our constituents. All that we've got from SNP and Green members is a tax on small town Scotland. I think they'll pay the price in 2021 for all their new taxes. Thank you. I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Colin Smith. Mr Gibson. Residing officer, over half of councils plan on dipping into the reserves this coming year and three quarters will increase council tax by the maximum amount in 2019-20. Children's services and education is the number one financial pressure for the second year running ahead of adult social care, which is still under severe demand pressures. Cuts are increasingly visible, with half of authorities feeling cuts are now, and I quote, negatively affecting relationships with local communities. Eight in ten councils say they're not confident in the sustainability of local government finance. Indeed, one in 20 councils are concerned that cuts are so deep they will struggle to deliver the legal minimum level of services, and 80% have no confidence in the current funding, funding model. Now more than ever, we need a thriving, resilient local government sector to weather the storm of national uncertainty, but years of chronic underfunding has left local government on life support. No, these comments are not about Scotland. They refer to English local authorities and were made only last week in public sector executive by local government information unit chief executive Jonathan Carr West. 
Richard Watts, Chair of the Local Government Association's Resources Board, said the survey illustrates the severity of the challenges after a 40 per cent cut in UK government funding for English councils, emphasising that the upcoming spending review will be make or break for vital council services. Speaking for COSLA, Tory councillor Gail McGregor told the Local Government and Communities Committee that duty funding cuts, and I quote, local government is collapsing in England and Wales. Whilst asking for more resources and fundraising powers, Councillor McGregor failed to say how much additional funding COSLA sought or where it would come from. Neither did any opposition MSP. Today we've got Tory MSPs bleating about alleged cuts in Scotland, whilst a UK government to which they display dog-like devotion eviscerates local authorities south of the border. The hypocrisy is simply breathtaking. Meanwhile, Labour MSPs will be disappointed that this budget does not include Labour's manifesto commitment to introduce workplace parking charges. However, it allows for an amendment to the Transport Bill, giving local authorities a choice of whether or not to introduce a parking levy, a power Labour, Lib Dem and Tory councils asked for, but which their parties now criticise or take uh, an intervention. Joanne Lamont. <clears throat> Ms Lamont, your microphone, please. That's it. No. Sorry, I wonder if you could clarify, are you saying that the job losses and the public service cuts and the closures are all alleged across Scotland, rather than the reality that far too many communities are going to have to experience? Kenneth Gibbs. Labour's uh, uh, absence of memory in this is unbelievable. I actually was a Glasgow councillor when Labour cut 9% from the city budget in one year and 3,500 jobs. This is a budget which increases local government funding. But of course, as we know, Labour is in truly dire straits. Once they covered the plains like the buffalo. When I was re-elected to Glasgow City Council in 1995, they numbered 77, while I was the sole SNP councillor. These days, sightings of Labour members are becoming increasingly rare, with 4,674 in Scotland chucking it last year, an 18.2% fall. The impact of Richard Leonard's leadership is similar to that of the Black Death on a medieval town. And with eight of their MPs resigning this week, so far, it's only Thursday, Project Corbyn has hit the rock. So what to do? Well, having a credible alternative, any alternative to this budget would be a good start. However, as they go the way of the dodo to prevent extinction, Jackie Bailey, Neil Finlay, John Lamont and James Kelly could perhaps form part of a captive breeding programme. Who will the silverback be, though? One wonders. Members of the public could pay to got but not feed. I can hear their meeting calls now, presiding officer. A decade ago, Labour set out their conditions for supporting the SNP's budget of the day. John Swinney met those demands in full, only to be told by Labour's then finance spokesperson Mara, Andy Kerr down, that he couldn't carry his own group. Of course, ultimately, Labour did at the second attempt for fear of an election back that budget. It showed though that even negotiating an agreement with them is no guarantee they will deliver. No doubt that's why Labour don't even bother to engage anymore, moaning about whatever the SNP proposes, but rarely a UK Tory government that's imposed austerity. has made them increasingly marginalised. I've taken an intervention. One is enough. I urge them to back Sit this down, budget please. and the come to the table with an open mind and some one. positive suggestions next year, although I will not be holding my breath. And it's funny how Labour are always deaf to the 28,000 local government jobs that have gone in Wales under their administration. But Mr Corbyn says, oh, that's because of UK government cuts, but they ignore UK government cuts to this parliament. The Lib Dems, one is all suspicious of any parliament or a country with the word Democrat in its title, like Vladimir Zhirinovsky's Liberal Democrats in Russia, People's Democratic Republic of North Korea, or Democratic Kampuchea. And so the famous five, led by a leader and capable of taking interventions, tell the SNP with 62 MSPs... Sit to down a minute, Mr Gibson. I can't That's hear. A cop -out. Sit down, please, just now. Mr Gibson. Mr Gibson, you can't hear me now. I can't hear what people are saying. But I want to hear what people are saying. Mr Gibson, please. I've told you. Mr Gibson. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, Willie, Willie Rennie and co need to participate. I know they fear losing unionist votes to Tories and Labour, but I'm sure their tactical voters will forgive them. This budget strengthens Scotland's stability in the face of Brexit uncertainty and takes our economy forward. It fully funds our economic action plan, improves the competitiveness competitiveness of our business environment and will bolster growth. My constituents will benefit from the 3.6% increase in NHS Ayrshire and Anne's budget to 720 million. Resource and capital available to North Ayrshire Council increases by 26.6 million from 279.842 million to 306.502 million. 
a 9.5% uplift. And we will introduce Frank's law, which shockingly Mills Briggs, who campaigned for it, will now vote against. We continue to support young people to develop a workforce with a skills base fit for the future by investing 600 million in Scotland's colleges, more than a billion in our universities and 214 million in apprenticeships and skills. Of course, there are some presiding officers who don't want Scotland to have an outward-looking economy and society who would rather our First Minister stayed at home rather than discuss trade and future relations in France, didn't address the Assembly National to set out Scotland's vision to support EU nationals post Brexit or promote Scottish business in North America. This government and this bid budget reject an insular, indecisive Scotland, reluctant to embrace the future, but one open to talent from around the world, to new opportunities and to prosperity for Thank all. Thank you. I call Colin Smith, who is followed by Stuart McMillan. Sorry, no, sir, when we look back on this parliamentary term and the budgets agreed, it will be remembered for the shameful attack on local council services. When SNP and Green MSPs rubber stamp the budget today, it will mean that across Scotland in the days and the weeks ahead, councillors of all political persuasions and none will once again have to wrestle with the painful choices. Which of their community services do they cut? Which of their neighbours' jobs do they axe? The debates taking place just now in council chambers up and down Scotland are not about which services to trim. They're about which services to scrap. The undeniable fact about this budget is that local councils face a £230 million real terms cut this year alone. That's not my figure, it's a figure from the Independent Scottish Parliament Information Centre. Extra burdens have been landed on councils without the full funding to meet those burdens and existing services, and that means cuts. And let's end this myth that these cuts to councils have nothing to do with the decisions of this government. That's somehow it's all somebody else's fault. The Scottish Parliament Information Centre has made clear that between 2013 and 2018, the Scottish Government cut council revenue budgets by 7.1 per cent, while its own budget fell by 1.3 per cent. Just as austerity from the UK Tories is their political choice, attacking local council services by this SNP Scottish Government is their political choice. And for SNP... We'll give way to Mr Mason. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member very much for giving way. If he would like to give more to local government, would he reduce that from the NHS? Colin Smith. What I would do, I would start by not going ahead with the tax cut that the SNP are proposing in this budget. People on £124,000 a year will be paying less tax this year than they were last year. That's something that anybody interested in progressive taxation should be ashamed of. And for SNP speakers... For SNP speakers today to pretend there are no cuts to councils is to close their eyes to what's happening in their own communities and to turn their backs on their own constituents. Now, I'd have far more respect for the SNP and this government if it had the guts to stand up and admit that the choices they want to make means local government will have to make cuts to many existing services. But for anyone to deny these cuts are being made at all is just not being honest with the people of Scotland. In my South Scotland region, I asked each council to tell me what this budget means for them. I asked every one of them, will there be cuts? And every one of them said yes. SNP Labour run Dumfries and Galloway told me they'll have to make cuts and raise taxes to fill a funding gap of over £15 million. And SNP East Ayrshire, it's £8 million. South Ayrshire, £10 million. Scottish Borders, £9 million. Midlothian, over £7 million. East Lothian, over £10 million in a second. And South Lanarkshire, they still need to find £11 million. And I've looked behind those figures to see what those cuts mean for people. I give way to Patrick Harvey. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to Mr Smith for giving way. In, in all seriousness, I understand and respect his anger and wish that the budget was better, even that it achieved perfection. Does he understand my frustration that a group of six of us have worked hard knocking our pans out for months to find costed proposals to make improvements, while dozens of Labour MSPs offer nothing in the way of constructive, realistic proposals for change? Colin Smith. What? When Patrick Harvey can be bought off with £90 million on a £42 billion budget, it's no wonder the SNP do deals with the Greens. I know the SNP have no intention of doing a deal with anyone else because keeping the Independence Coalition together is more important than keeping council services. That's what's important. Now, 
No, I've, I've given away already and I probably won't have enough time to give any more. Now I've looked behind some of these cuts and let's look at the reality. Redundancies in council jobs, including cuts in teaching posts and learning support at a time a third of Scottish children leave primary school without the expected attainment levels in literacy and numeracy. The accident of leisure services when a third of Scotland's school children are obese. The ending of lifeline taxi card schemes for older people when we live in an ageing population. I could list more and more from the pages and pages of cuts in the report sitting in the desk of councillors as we speak. It's heartbreaking and it should shame every single one of us. But what is even more shameful is the way the SNP demean their own councillors by pretending the cuts don't exist. Enough is enough. It's time to stop these cuts. To be honest enough to say that if we want high quality public services, we have to properly use the progressive tax powers of this parliament, not cut taxes for the rich as this budget proposes. At a time, at a time the SM, well, Patrick Harvey says, and a Patrick Harvey says this budget doesn't cut taxes. Well, the rally it is, it's an indefense and he said it's the UK budget. Well, you could reverse those decisions because you have the power to do it. It is indefensible. It is indefensible that someone earning as much as £124,000 will pay less income tax this year than they did last year. Most higher rate taxpayers, including people earning more than £100,000, will receive a £140 tax cut. Well, our schools and care for the elderly services that are the very fabric of our communities face cuts. Astonishingly, between the draft budget and the final budget today, we have seen a deal done that chooses not to raise progressive taxation, such as the top rate of income tax, but actually increases regressive taxes on the poor. Councils are facing raising council tax by nearly 5%, and of course, we now have plans for a new car park tax on workers. Now, I recognise that fiscal measures have a role to play in protecting our environment. But this is a regressive tax with the company boss paying the same as the company cleaner. The exemptions the government proposed mean the chief executive of a health board on £100,000 won't pay, but the carer who works for a charity and is paid the minimum wage will pay. No wonder Unison says it devalues the contribution of council workers and other staff who, like their health service colleagues, deliver vital services. No wonder the GMB say it's an attack on the take-home pay okay, of workers. Close, no wonder please. Unite say the levy is a desperate attempt to resolve the, the government from the funding crisis they preside over. Presiding officer, this budget could have been an opportunity for progressive politics, a chance to stop the cut to council services. The SNP and Greens are good when it comes to the rhetoric of ending austerity, come but this close, budget please. shows they're all talk and it's ordinary workers and services that are paying the price. Uh, we are tight for time, if members could be mindful of that, please. Stuart McMillan, followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, officer. Uh, I will be voting for the budget today and urge all parties to do so, uh, to put an end to their oppositionist and ill-thought-out reasoning to vote against it. Every budget is challenging, and no budget, whether it's in Parliament or a local authority, will be perfect. And Patrick Harvey touched upon that earlier on in his comments. How can it be that every politician will actually want more money to be spent on a wide variety of items, and, uh, and the pot of money isn't bottomless. Considering that this is a parliament of minorities once again, as it was intended to be apparently, and then surely it's incumbent upon all the parties to put forward genuine proposals and enter into genuine dialogue to try to get some wins that they actually want. Unfortunately, the hapless, the Tories, and the hopeless, Labour, have proven once again to be failures at wanting to improve the budget, and then there are the Lib Dems. I'll be voting for the budget tonight, and here are just some of the reasons why. 55% of income taxpayers will pay less than those in the rest of the UK. 99% of income taxpayers will pay the same or less than last year. It will deliver a whopping £729 million extra for health and care services. It provides £180 million for attainment, including £120 million to head teachers to close the attainment gap. And also we heard from Tom Arthur earlier regarding uh, the success that's going on in Remshire Council and over £5 billion of capital investment, including more new homes for my Greenock and Inverclyde constituency. Building on the new homes in recent years, including those in Slane, Port Glasgow, which the Housing Minister went to uh, only a couple of months ago, and also uh, the 200 that were, uh, that were passed through planning last week at Inverclyde Council for St. Stephen, the old St. Stephen's High School site in Port Glasgow. These measures, and many, many more, are in the face of the continued Tory obsession with austerity which has seen Scotland's resource block grant slashed by two billion pounds, by two billion pounds in real terms since 2010. Okay. <clears throat> Johan Lamont. 
Can you explain why you justify a disproportionate cut to local government, which is meaning a loss of jobs in public services across Scotland and, as far as I'm aware, also in your constituency? How on earth can you describe that as a fair budget that you're happy to vote for at five o'clock? Will members remember to speak through the chair, please? Stuart McMillan. Uh, first of all, that's not true. And secondly, I'm going to come on to local government in a wee minute. Right. Signing off, sir, the fact this SNP Scottish Government is still managing to do these things speaks volumes for the excellent way Derek Mackay is doing his job as the Finance Secretary. Instead of, instead of the opposition parties greeting and governing from the sidelines, they should actually be thanking Derek Mackay for actually delivering a budget that is going to deliver for our country. They should also be asking what more they can do to stop their head offices in London from actually working against Scotland and also Scotland's budget. Now, the Scottish Government uh, will also continue to spend almost £100 million mitigating Tory welfare cuts, including the bedroom tax, which Michelle Ballantyne shamefully claims does not exist. Now, Murdo Fraser touched upon £100 million earlier on in his comments. And, Mr Fraser, that £100 million that Mr Mackay is putting in to actually mitigate could be better spent on something more progressive for a nation as compared to solely trying to mitigate against the worst obsession of Tory cuts. Now, I'll give Michelle Ballantyne an opportunity to actually stand up to apologise to the 80,000 Scots affected by this callous policy, if she wants to do so. Michelle Ballantyne. People in the room quite clearly know that what I said is it's not a bedroom tax. It was the removal of a spare room subsidy, not a tax. It's a subsidy. Stuart McMillan. So it's a, OK, so it's a subsidy, it's not a tax. All right, OK, once again, the Tories proving yet again they do not understand and they do not comprehend what's going on in the real world, in our streets, our communities in Scotland. Uh, there's also, uh, there's also the, the, this £100 million is also in addition to the investment in food banks from £1.5 million to £3.5 million, which it also is a consequence of a brutalist Tory regime with no heart, no compassion and also absolutely no clue of the real world. Now just think, signing officer, if the Scottish Government actually had extra money uh, to spend, it could invest in many other ways as compared to solely mitigating against Tory cuts. Uh, <clears throat> signing officer, only last week the UK Government's uh, Working Pension Secretary Amber Rudd admitted for the first time that universal credit has driven people to food banks. So if the Tory UK government can finally admit their policies are leading people to destitution in food banks, why can't the Tories here in the Scottish Parliament? And I'll give the Tories uh, another opportunity to actually ex to apologise to the population of Scotland for their, for their obscene policies, but also do any of them actually agree with Amber Rudd? Okay, silence says it all. Presenting officer, time and time again, this chamber hears the requests and demands that the Scottish Government spend more money on a wide range of issues. Mills Briggs has been a regular campaigner for Frank's Law and also increasing carers allowance. This budget is delivering that. Is he going to vote against that tonight at five o'clock? <coughs> uh, also, in, in October, the Tories also demand the Scottish Government ensure all Barnet consequentials as a result of the increased health spending go direct to the NHS and social care. This budget delivers that and also even exceeds it. Are the Tories seriously going to vote against another one of their own demands? Also in October, Monica Lennon. Monica Lennon was claiming credit Mr. for Mr McMillan's just closing. Monica Lennon was claiming credit for Labour as the First Minister announced there will be access to school counselling services. This budget delivers that. Are Labour seriously going to vote against that and also one of their own demands? Now, signing off, sir. Um, Monday the 4th, February 2002, uh, Labour-led Inverclyde Council, also Labour-led Dem Scottish Executive. Close, please. Uh, four, billion, so four million pounds worth of cuts to Inverclyde Council budget. And also, the council leader at the time said, this is standard procedure and I'm confident officers will come up with recommendations to address this. We are dealing with it as please we do in close, every Mr. year. Okay. Thank you very much for signing off, sir. Liz Smith, followed by John Mason. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, when the budget process began in this chamber on the 31st of January, my colleague Murdo Fraser set out why the context of this debate was so crucial, most especially in terms of the prognosis for economic growth and employment in Scotland, the gap between income tax rates in Scotland and the rest of the UK, and the responses from business and investors. And obviously, since that stage one period, these issues have been very hotly debated in this chamber, and that's quite right. But I think it's also important to look at what people outside this chamber are saying, and I'll come to that in just a minute. But let me start with what we heard earlier, namely that one of the Scottish Government's own economic advisers 
complained that the budget was presented in a format of confusing data and he said that it had a narrative around it which was designed to sway opinion in favour of Scottish Government's interpretation of that data rather than the data being presented on an objective basis. And I think that makes for the difficult scrutiny of the budget. And that criticism of the presentation of the budget came hard on the heels of the Cabinet Secretary for Finance saying when he was providing evidence in front of the Finance Committee that he had not undertaken any individual analysis of the proposed car parking tax, just as Pauline McNeill pointed out earlier. And that was just that it was much more something to do with the deal that had been struck with the Greens. And I think the Cabinet Secretary will come to regret that. I wonder if you don't mind, uh, Mr Whiteman. And I think you, the Cabinet Secretary will come to regret that because neither of these are signs that point to a Scottish Government which is intent on providing the Scottish people with maximum transparency about the implications of major policy announcements. Part, I, yes, I will, very quickly. Derek Mackay. Can I thank Liz Smith for taking the intervention? And Liz Smith said she'll be turning to what the outside world think about the Scottish budget. How would Liz Smith uh, respond to the business community who have said in writing in media reports that it is important that the budget passes to give Scotland the necessary resources to get on with the job. They didn't want a position where a budget couldn't pass, which would have been the case if I was left to negotiate with only the Conservatives. Liz Smith. Cabinet Secretary, you have succeeded in uniting the business community, industry, half the public at least of Scotland, many of your members, against this car parking tax. So I'm not going to take any lectures on that basis. Now, we've been accused of being hysterical and being all, all, all kinds of things about this car parking tax. But unfortunately for the Scottish Government, this is not about real devolution of powers to local authorities in the way that they think, because this is unravelling before their eyes. The tax is a Scottish Government policy, the brokerage of the deal with the Greens, whereby the implementation and the exemption for at least those workers using NHS buildings was decided by the Scottish Government. Mm. Not by local authorities, but never mind, says Mr Mackay, because it would be up to local authorities to consider further exemptions. But then it turns out there are a whole lot of complexities and complications about these other possible e exemptions, very well explained by some members this afternoon. Complications that have been caused by central government. So please don't come to the Scottish Conservatives and tell us that we're being inconsistent. It is the SNP that are being ho wholly inconsistent about this policy. And I think most of Scotland agrees with that. But it's not just in terms of the budget that we're seeing this issue. Because in education, we've had this same dilemma about whether policies are taken at central government level or whether they are in fact devolved to local authorities. We were told in 2017 and in 2018 that the school governance bill was a flagship bill to devolve power to head teachers because, and I quote John Swinney, head teachers are best placed to take decisions in their own schools. I could not agree more with that. But suddenly the bill was scrapped and the status quo endures. We were told that the new regional collaboratives would be further devolution of power. Yet many of the people involved in these collaboratives are complaining constantly that they are at the behest of central government and the education agencies telling them what to do. And when it comes to PEF funding, a very good initiative, as Mr Arthur rightly pointed out, it seems that a head teacher is not quite as free to spend the money as he or she originally thought because his ideas or her ideas have to be spent and considered by a local authority first. Kate Forbes. Debate about localism. Does Liz Smith agree with Tory councillors in Edinburgh who believe that local car parking decisions should be made by local authorities? Liz Smith. I, I personally don't agree with the local tax at all because of the, base, because of the basis in which the SNP has set this out. Where, where I take huge exception to the SNP is the fact that they are pretending that this is a measure, a policy measure, that has been devolved to local authorities when it's no such thing. It is the Scottish Government, central level, that has been setting the parameters of this debate. And that is what people don't like. Now, presiding officer, can I just finish on uh, two points here? I still can't get into my head why the Cabinet Secretary believes that he is able to refute the evidence from the Chancellor's announcements in October last year that he has an addition 
of an extra 950 million to the Scottish block grant and he tries to tell us that he's actually got less money. I don't understand that and I don't think many mem members in this chamber actually do. And nor has he explained why he thinks that increasing the tax burden in Scotland is going to deliver the economic growth and the investment and all the jobs that we need to have to ensure that Scotland can flourish in the future. And it's on that basis that I will be voting against this budget. John Mason, followed by Mark Macdonald. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I speak in support of the budget today. I have to say I think it's a very reasonable budget, given the circumstances, the uncertainty of Brexit is damaging both for businesses and for individuals. So confidence in Scotland and throughout the UK is at a low ebb. The UK is not in a good place economically, and we have to do the best we can with what we have. On Tuesday, we focused on income tax, and I'm comfortable that we are being more progressive while trying not to provoke serious behaviour change, such as rich taxpayers leaving the country. And I'm also comfortable that we are aiming to free up local authorities to introduce more local taxes that might suit them, for example, the tourist tax and the parking levy. And longer term, I would also support a replacement for the council tax, which I think is a challenge to get us all to agree, but I believe is achievable. And on the expenditure side, we are trying to be fair to various sectors, because frankly, none of us in here or out in the real world can get all the expenditure that we would like. If we give more to local government, it means less for health. If we spend more on preventative health care, it means less for hospitals and reactive drugs. If we spend more on primary schools, it means less for secondary schools. Again, I'm disappointed that Conservatives and other members simply do not seem to understand this simple arithmetic. If I, if I could mention a few things that have been mentioned during the debate so far, and there have been uh, certain themes and certain points that have come up a number of times from speakers, and one of these is clearly the parking levy. So I think we do need to get a few facts uh, out into the public domain. Uh, Murdo Fraser, I think, was the first person to uh, mention that. And he knows, as we all know, that there is a legislative process for anything like this. It will have to go, uh, the government will have to consult, the committee, which in this case is the REC committee, has said uh, that it will definitely be consulting. Uh, there will have to be an amendment examined, debated uh, at stage one, at stage two, at stage three. So we have a long way to go on this issue. The government and the Greens have put forward a plan. It will be consulted on at committee, but it will be parliament that decides on this for the way ahead. And for members to start suggesting a lot of detail that just hasn't even been consulted on yet is quite frankly nonsense. Let me finish this bit and I'll come back to uh, the member if he wants. It's been suggested that the parking levy is automatically unfair. Well, we haven't, as we said, we haven't even discussed the details yet. But let's remember that many of these parking places are for directors and top people paid in city centres. If I look at Glasgow City Centre, for example, it is not the cleaners in the council who have got a parking place. It is either the councillors or the directors or these kind of people. Even if we look at the Scottish Parliament here, as I understand it, the car park downstairs is not used generally by the cleaners and the security people and all of these it is used by MSPs and potentially by top paid workers. So on the whole, and I, I agree we need to consult, and I agree there can be exceptions, but on the whole, this parking levy will hit the highest paid people. I said I'll take an intervention when I finish this point on parking levies. Uh, I would also say to Dean Lockhart again that the parking levy is not in the budget. Uh, yes, the government has made an agreement with the Greens, but uh, the transport bill would have to be amended, and there is no certainty that that will happen. Um, and... Uh, the parking levy ha has not yet been studied in detail. Liz Smith uh, made that point. Absolutely, we're all agreed and open about that. She complained about the way the budget facts had been presented in a number of areas. And I wonder if she would also complain that some of her own colleagues uh, have been spreading a uh, conjecture as facts, for example, using a £500 figure, which has absolutely no basis in reality. I think I said I would give way to Mr Green. Jamie Green. Can I thank Mr Mason for giving away? First of all, can I state that the committee has not come to any public arrangements as to how it will process uh, this amendment, and nor is that public information for the benefit of the Chamber. But if it is defeated, 
by the committee at stages two or indeed at stage three by this parliament. What effect does Mr Mason really think that will have on next year's budget discussions if a deal that has been done between the SNP and the Greens is reneged upon because of the processes of the parliament? John Mason. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not going to speculate what's going to happen in next year's budget, and the Greens are more than able to speak for themselves. But as I understand it, they have uh, asked for the government agreement to introduce an amendment, and that's uh, as far as it goes. And committee will, uh, committee will, I am sure, the REC committee, as Mr Green knows, is a fairly independent committee which will look at things logically and objectively. And I think both he and I uh, will be doing that as part of the process, and we will see where that takes us. I fear that I'm going to uh, run out of time here uh, looking at these issues. Can I just also mention, though, something else that was said in the debate, which was from Labour. The only clarity we have had is that they want to raise the 46p to the 50p. Uh, I think they are taking a big risk in making a 4p jump, which would give a 5p difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK. We know, we know there can be behavioural change. I would suggest that if we are going to change it, we go one pence at a time and we do not do uh, a very large jump. Presiding officer, I was also going to say something about manifestos and how they give a direction of travel, but manifestos are dependent on a party becoming the majority government and they can impose their uh, decisions and their uh, directions of government. Any minority uh, cannot impose its a, 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 a manifesto and needs to compromise and needs to get agreement with other parties and that applies to everyone else as well. But overall, I'm more than happy to support this budget. Thank you very much. Mark MacDonald, followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Much as I accept the mathematical irrelevance of my position, I state at the outset that I will be backing the budget at five o'clock this evening. I want, however, to offer a few thoughts in the hope that they might be uh, well received, or at least received, uh, in relation to consideration for future years. Firstly, on taxation, I've long held the view that the step from £43,430 to £150,000 is too great. It's a point I noted James Kelly making in the Chamber on Tuesday. I asked Spice to run some potential scenarios, and they concluded that the introduction of a 44p rate at £75,000 and a 48p rate at £150,000 would realise an additional £120 million which could be spent on priorities. Now, while that might not seem a huge sum in the global budget, I do believe it addresses principles of tax fairness and also opens up potential revenue streams which could be utilised for various priorities, some of which members have highlighted in the Chamber this evening. And I do feel that we need to get away from this nonsense narrative that taxation somehow equals theft. It's a means by which the state invests in services and support for communities from which everyone benefits regardless of their income. In fact, people who are on generally high incomes have tended to benefit disproportionately as a result of, for example, education services which are invested in infrastructure services which support businesses uh, and also uh, the employment of workforce who themselves have to be uh, educated and supported as well. I recognise that the Tories support the concept of a smaller state. Uh, that's a valid philosophical position, albeit one I disagree passionately with. But I think that they do spend a little bit too much time talking about how taxes should be reduced and, a little bit, and not enough time talking about where they would disinvest in order to realise that vision of a smaller state. And perhaps they would benefit from sharing that vision more openly in the Chamber so we could have a proper discussion in relation to that. I think we need to think seriously about how we encourage and promote greater collaboration and cooperation not just across the public sector, but between public, third and private sectors. There remain too many silo approaches out there, too many services where owning the spend equals owning the saving, rather than looking at how benefits can be achieved across sectors. This Parliament had to legislate to ensure health and social care integration took place. It shouldn't need legislation to encourage greater collaboration. One means to address this could be to look at funding less on a sectoral basis, but more on a geographical basis and use, for example, community planning partnerships as a means to encourage local budget setting and planning for priorities. That, I accept, would require a radical shift in how we do budgets in Scotland, involving much earlier start to the process. But I think if we want to truly encourage uh, localism, it would be a good step to consider, not necessarily for next year, but for future budget years. Finally, I think we need to consider how we best involve the people in our budget process. A number of years ago, I visited Malmo in Sweden as part of a local government committee visit. 
Local authorities spoke highly of their citizen jury model, where a selection of citizens chosen by the electoral roll and balanced for representation of gender and ethnicity are consulted on proposals and feed into the budget process. I think there's merit in exploring such an approach in Scotland, which could ensure we hear voices beyond the perennially engaged as we consider what the priorities of the Parliament would be, we could be informed in that process of the priorities of the people. I don't expect these thoughts necessarily to go very far, but I hope I've, by putting them on the record they might at least achieve some consideration uh, from ministers for future years. The last of the open debate contributions is from Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be able to speak in this important debate as a member of the Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee. And I'd like to focus my comments this afternoon on a few key points. The investment that this government has made in our NHS, the protection afforded to workers through the rates resolution, as well as the uncertainty that Brexit has and indeed continuing to cause for businesses and our economy. President Officer, I welcome that this budget delivers almost three quarters of a billion pounds, 729 million extra for health and care services in Scotland, with a particular focus on mental health. This investment has allowed the Scottish Government to increase mental health funding to 1.1 billion and to increase mental health funding for young people by 12 million pounds. The 12 million will provide around 350 school counsellors across Scotland's secondary schools, allowing young people across my South Scotland region the opportunity to speak about their mental health openly with qualified professionals who can provide targeted and faster support for any problems which may present themselves. Additionally, I'm pleased to see that our higher education institutions will benefit from 80 additional counsellors being implemented over the next four years, as well as an additional 250 school nurses who will be in place by 2020. Presiding officer, I'm also pleased to see that the rates resolutions agreed by the Parliament will protect our middle earners. And I spoke in the debate on Tuesday about this as well. I focused on nurses, allied healthcare professionals, teachers and social workers by ensure that their levels of income tax remain fair, proportionate and at the lowest levels in the UK. Indeed, when speaking... Yes, I will, Colin Smith. Colin Smith. Uh, your microphone's not on, Mr Smith. Oh, there you are. Thank you very much. You have lit up as you stand there. <laughs> Not, 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 not for the first time, presiding officer, not for the first time. Does Emma Harper accept that what this budget means when she mentions teachers is that dozens of teachers will be axed in Dumfries and Galloway when they set their budget next week because of £16 million worth of cuts in council services? Emma Harper. If I may just do one word answer because of time, presiding officer, I'll say nah. <laughs> Indeed, when speaking in the rates resolution debate, I pointed out that nurses on a band five salary, that's 68% of all nurses, will be actually having their salary protected. They will be either on the basic or intermediate rates of income tax paying 20 or 21% in rates, the equivalent of around £4,425.50 per year. That's the lowest in the UK. On Tuesday, I also highlighted the efforts the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that Scotland remains an attractive place for business, families and people. The Cabinet Secretary in the Budget has committed to freezing the higher rate of tax thresholds for higher earners, such as consultants, radiologists and surgeons, at £43,000 and £150 for the top rate earners. These professionals are absolutely needed in Scotland and many are our EU citizens and they're welcome in Scotland, but are, they're being met with nothing but chaos, hostility and sheer disrespect from an out-of-touch UK government. Poseidon officer, it would be remiss of me not to mention the uncertainty that Brexit has caused for businesses and the Scottish economy. Indeed, at, f at the Finance and Constitution Committee meeting, we've taken evidence from numerous experts warning of the real risks of Brexit to businesses and our economy. One such example comes from the OBR, who at committee told us that they had a forecast prior to the EU referendum showing that, assuming that there had been a vote to remain in the EU, our economy would have grown by roughly 4.5% between the time of the referendum and now. This is a figure which I always remember as it shows the extent of the damage that the Tories' Brexit, this burich of a Brexit, and the infighting that it has had on the country and our economy. 
However, I am pleased that we have a government in Scotland working to mitigate its consequences, and I ask the Scottish Government to continue to do all it can to protect Scotland from the UK Government's Brexit chaos. Presiding officer, while I am conscious of the time, I would like to briefly touch on other steps the Scottish Government has taken in the proposed budget which will benefit people across Dumfries and Galloway in my South Scotland region. The budget will deliver over £435 million of direct assistance through social security interventions. The investment of £3.5 million in the Fair Share Food Fund will assist national projects such as Fair Share which provide food unused by the big supermarkets such as Asda, Tesco and Morrisons to communities across Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell spoke about this at portfolio questions earlier today. This investment will help the staff and volunteers at Summerhill Community Centre in Dumfries, who I just visited last week. Summerhill receives a weekly delivery from Fairshare, which is then distributed to families and people across North West Dumfries, from Lochside and Lincluden to Sandside, as well as to the Aberlour charity and to the Summerhill community also. This is a really important support investment for the people in my area. In conclusion, this budget sees record investment in our NHS, our schools, our social security system and in our people, families and public services. It sees 55% of people pay less in income tax compared to other parts of the UK. And most importantly, it allows Scotland, in a time of Brexit chaos, to remain an attractive place for people and families to come to live, work and study. And I would urge members across chamber to vote for this budget at decision time. Thank you. We now move to the closing speeches. We're really pushed for time. Andy Whiteman, two minutes, please. Officer, Greens are pleased with what we've achieved in this budget. We have long argued that local government finance, powers and autonomy need to be substantially reformed and enhanced. And by securing a deal that begins the overdue process of strengthening the fiscal powers of local government, we hope that this will be seen in future as an important turning point. A fiscal framework a three-year funding deal, the clearest commitment to date to scrap the regressive council tax, new fiscal powers over tourism and workplace parking, and a budget that provides greater resource and flexibility for local councils are achievements that we're proud of. And in a parliament where no party has a majority, a coalition has to be built to secure support. Parliament has now instigated a new approach to budget scrutiny. But how the budget is developed and negotiated is a quite separate matter, one that is substantially in the gift of ministers. And as we have seen this year, there has been no shortage of outrage and opposition, no shortage or lack of colourful rhetoric of rescue deals, capitulation and betrayal, all accompanied by a distinct lack of serious engagement in budget negotiations. In future, I hope we can do things better, and I want to conclude with a proposal to achieve that. In 2019, the Finance Secretary should convene roundtable talks in September to discuss specific proposals, both of his own party and government and of other parties. Such talks should be followed by further detailed discussion and negotiation following the UK budget. Such efforts, and they will only be efforts, can then inform the draft budget published in November or December. And building on whatever progress and trust has been established, detailed negotiations can then take place over the budget bill in Parliament. And this may even involve parties publishing their proposals and submitting them to scrutiny by the Finance Committee. Presiding officer, such a process could ease tensions, build trust, arrow led red lines and aspirations to be properly assessed and tested and ultimately, although there's no guarantee and parties would be free to rule themselves out of the process, increase the chances of a budget for Scotland built on a shared collaborative endeavour. Well, Monica Lennon, no more than six minutes please. Thank you, presiding officer. Our communities deserve better than this budget. Scottish Labour cannot support a, an austerity budget that inflicts cuts on public services while delivering tax cuts to the wealthiest in our society. Instead, Scottish Labour want a budget that will help lift people out of poverty and help build stronger communities with well-resourced public services. We ask the Scottish Government to include our anti-poverty policies in the budget, but they declined. The result is a budget 
The result is a budget that is a total disappointment from a government that claims to be progressive and ambitious for Scotland. Derek Mackay. And as fair uh, of a finance secretary, I asked the Labour Party how they would pay for it. I got no answers. Can Monica Lennon tell us here and now, beyond the top rate of tax, what would the, any other rate of tax be under a Labour government to fund those policies? Last chance. Explain <laughs> your position. Monica Lennon. I think the Cabinet Secretary should be on his last chance because that is simply not true. That is simply not true. And James Kelly and Scottish Labour colleagues entered discussions in good faith and we got nothing out of this Cabinet Secretary. And what the Cabinet Secretary, what the Cabinet Secretary failed to talk about, if he cares to listen, what the Cabinet Secretary failed to talk about at all was child poverty. At the front of our own minds, when we went into discussion, we're the one in four children in Scotland who are living in poverty. Front benchers think it's funny, but one in four children in Scotland are living in poverty. Excuse so me, excuse me, Miss Lennon. Miss Campbell, would you please stop shouting? Thank you, Miss Lennon. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary for Communities agrees with Scottish Labour, because when we asked for a five pound child benefit top up, there was clear evidence that that would lift 30,000 children out of poverty, a policy that has wide support in Scotland from charities and trade unions alike. No, I'm going to make some progress because Derek Mackay said no to that. Um, Aileen Campbell maybe already knows the answer. And that's part of the budget that we could have had. Even the SNP's own highly respected former uh, special adviser, Kevin Pringle, described this as a missed opportunity. Scottish Labour is sick of seeing our public services and workers struggle. We ask for more funding for public services because when they are properly resourced, all of our communities are stronger for it. Instead, shamefully, this SNP budget will cut council budgets in real terms by 230 million, taking total cuts. Total, no, it's not wrong, Cabinet Secretary. Taking total cuts since 2011 to £1.5 billion. Pounds. Derek Mackay spins these cuts as efficiencies, but let's make no mistake, these are devastating cuts that put lifeline services at risk. And every single MSP in this chamber knows that to be true. And on tax, as James Kelly outlined, Scotland's tax bans require progressive and fair brackets Labour would make Labour would make the riches pay their fair share, but the SNP tax plans are weak, rewarding higher earners with tax cuts. And on rail, as Scottish as uh, Colin Smith said earlier, we are proposing a fair freeze because we are listening to the people of Scotland who have made their voices heard about poor rail services, overcrowded trains, and the unaffordable hike in fair. Cost. But again, the Scottish Government isn't listening. Rail fares have increased, while ScotRail's performance has plummeted. Another missed opportunity to do something about the cost of living. And look at the big picture, the big challenges that Scotland faces. Audit Scotland warns that the future of our NHS is not sustainable. We are not seeing the transformational change needed to reform and integrate health and social care. The government needs to be transparent about the funding our NHS actually needs. Chronic underfunding has pushed health boards to crisis. The Health Secretary's own board, NHS Ayrshire and Arran, has been underfunded for years and faces cuts of over £40 million next year. Surely the Health Secretary believes her own constituents deserve better than that. Derek Mackay. Uh, can I thank Monica Lennon for allowing me to make the intervention? Can Monica Lennon then explain why she'll be voting against an increase in the NHS budget of over yeah. £700 million yeah. pounds tonight? And if she wants even more money for public services, by how much would tax have to be increased to pay for Labour's demands? Monica Lennon. Presiding officer, this budget is weak. It is not tackling the challenges that are underlying. Because it's not simply about more money for the NHS. Let's look at the facts. Life expectancy has stalled. The death rates have begun to rise for people who live in our poorest communities. Health inequalities in Scotland are worsening. Cuts to council services. 
cuts to council services are shutting doors on the most vulnerable people in our community. So that's not helping Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary has dismissed Labour's progressive policies from the outset. And perhaps again he should have listened to former advisor Kevin Pringle, because he was right when he said poor people die younger, but the poverty that kills them lives on. The levels of poverty in Scotland are unacceptable. Our poverty proof proposals for the budget would have saved lives, you because when we close. have policies that tackle poverty. We tackle the causes of ill health and please. that's the issues that matter in this budget or should have mattered to this government. Adam Tompkins, up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. There is record employment in the United Kingdom. There are more jobs in the British economy now than at any point in our history. Across Britain, the employment rate is up and the unemployment rate is down. And at the same time, wages are rising. Youth unemployment is down, and we have more disabled people in Britain in work than ever before. And the OBR is forecasting that all this is set to continue, with 800,000 more jobs across Britain to be set, set to be created by 2023. This, presiding officer, is what Conservative government delivers. Yeah. Meanwhile, one, meanwhile, let me make some progress. Meanwhile, in the SNP's Scotland, we have slower growth, higher taxes and worse public services. That's Derek Mackay's achievement and that's Nicola Sturgeon's legacy. What Scotland needs, presiding officer, is a budget for growth. A budget that attracts jobs to the Scottish economy. A budget that brings taxpayers to Scotland Mr. and not one that drives them away. What Scotland needs, presiding officer, is a budget for business, a budget for the high street, a budget that boosts the Scottish economy, not one that punishes it. Let me make some progress. But what we are getting from the SNP Green Alliance is the very opposite of what Scotland needs. What we are getting are higher taxes on workers, higher taxes on families, new taxes on jobs, and tax hikes which the SNP promised in the election campaign that they would not inflict on hard-working Scots. But nationalist campaign pledges are not worth the paper they're printed on. These are not tax rises on the rich, presiding officer. Everyone in Scotland who earns more than £27,000 will pay more tax than they would in England. In effect, a tax rise on teachers, a tax rise on senior nurses, a tax rise on police officers and a tax rise on firefighters. A tax rise on middle income earners, a tax rise on ordinary hard-working families. If you earn £49,000, presiding officer, you'll be paying a whopping £1,300 more every year in income tax in the SNP Scotland than you would be if you lived south of the border. So is it any wonder that the FSB have said that the SNP's latest tax rises will erode the trust of the small business community? Is it any wonder that the life sciences sector has warned that income tax differences between Scotland and England will hurt their ability to recruit the skilled workers that the Scottish economy so badly needs? Is it any wonder that the CBI has warned that income tax could become a major, issues, a major issue for companies keen to attract the best talent? In one minute, I'll, I will give the way to the Cabinet Secretary. And is it any wonder that the Scottish Chambers of Commerce have warned that it could take years to repair the damage of Derek Mackay's higher taxes. And if he wants to respond to any of those points, I'll happily give way to him. Derek Mackay. To know from Mr Tompkins exactly where in Scotland's public sector the half a billion pound cut should come from to pay for the Tory tax cuts that they want us to implement and mirror the Chancellor's Tory tax cuts for the highest earners in this Adam country. Adam Tompkins. Presiding officer, is that none of these tax rises are necessary because the Scottish Government's budget is already increasing by half a, million, half a billion pounds in real terms in this year. Now, none of these warnings are remotely surprising, presiding officer, but what is shameful is that Nicola Sturgeon's SNP are deaf to all these warnings. They don't care about growing the Scottish economy. All they care about is pandering to the hard left tax policies of Patrick Harvey's Green Party. It's not that the Greens don't believe in growth, they're positively opposed to it. And they are so vehemently anti-car that they probably think the invention of the wheel was a retrograde step. And yet this small, 
collective of unpopular politicians is the group that Derek Mackay chooses to do his budget business with. And where has this ill-fated alliance of nationalists and Greens led him? To the genius idea of the car park tax, so genius that it's been in several Labour Party manifestos. A proposal that John Swinney, Bruce Crawford and Fergus Ewing have all spoken out against in the past. SNP MSP Richard Lyle recently said this about it. I am not for your, I am not for your parking charge levy, he said. And I speak on behalf of thousands of motorists who have been taxed enough. Yeah. Well, well, quite. Yet each of these great heavyweights of the SNP will be voting for this tax tonight. John Swinney, Bruce Crawford and Fergus Ewing all voting for something which they don't believe in and which they know is wrong. Why? Because appeasing the Greens is more important to them than sound public policy. And as for the claim, presiding officer, as for the claim that this is not really a tax rise at all, but some sort of welcome empowerment of local authorities, this isn't about localism at all. The devolved tax powers of this parliament mean that we can vote either to raise or lower tax rates. And if the SNP were serious about localism, they would grant the same powers, the same freedom of choice to local authorities. But the only power being given to councils under this proposal is a power to impose new taxes. We can choose to put taxes up or down, but under this proposal, councils can choose only to put it up. That isn't localism. That isn't localism. As Unite the Unions, Scot uh, Scottish Secretary Pat Rafferty has said just today, presiding officer, the car park tax is a desperate attempt to absolve the government from the funding crisis that they have presided over. And if implemented, he said, if implemented, we would have the ludicrous situation where we would have local authorities taxing workers for turning up to work. But we shouldn't worry, presiding officer, we shouldn't worry, because Mr Harvey thinks that an additional £500 a year tax on low-paid workers is trivial. That's the word he used this afternoon. Yeah. Presiding officer, in a few moments, we will have the unbridled joy of listening to another budget speech from the Cabinet Secretary. Since he announced his harebrained car park tax, a number of questions have emerged about it. Now, we know that he did precisely no economic modelling of this tax before announcing it. We know that there was no impact assessment. We know that he did not think it through. But in the three weeks since he announced it, he has had time to address the concerns that have been brought to his attention. So, will he answer any of the following questions about this tax in his summing up? No. First, where employers pay this tax on behalf of their employees, will this count as a benefit in kind for the purposes of income tax? Yeah. Yeah. Second, does he agree that this is a regressive tax, that it will hit lower paid workers hardest? Yeah. Third, if NHS properties are to be exempt from the new tax, a decision taken centrally, by the way, reinforcing the point that this has nothing to do with localism, will GP's surgeries also be exempt, and if not, why not? Fourth, will teachers be expected to pay for this tax, to pay this tax for driving to work? Fifth, if the tax is passed on to employees, will it be subject to VAT, putting up the cost to workers uh, Mr. even Tomkins more? Mr Tompkins is just closing. And sixth, and finally, presiding officer, if firms don't comply with this unwanted, ill-conceived tax, will they be fined, landing businesses in Scotland with even more costs, even more bureaucracy and even more expense? Six Close, unanswered please. questions about just this one aspect of Derek Mackay's shambles of a budget. Let's see if he can answer any of them. I now call Derek Mackay. Ten minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, you know, I thought that that contribution from Adam Tompkins is a both a disservice to Adam Tompkins and this parliament. And the reason I say that, the reason I say that, the reason I say that is what we have been asked as parliamentarians to do tonight is to vote on a budget of £42.5 billion for our public services, our economy and our people. That speech was not about the workplace parking levy about parking. It's a diversion from the reality that we are facing right now. This is the budget that we are being asked to approve tonight, and that's where people should have focused their minds. But I will say, I, I, I will say this, it was it, remarkable. And, and Adam Tompkins referenced the current economic uh, indicators in the UK. But of course, he didn't tell you 
that unemployment in Scotland right now is at a record low of 3.5%, outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. So if, if the SNP government is responsible, we'll take responsibility for record low unemployment in Scotland right now. And those economic credentials are indeed strong. You know, the Fiscal Commission that informs the budget, informs the debate, wasn't mentioned by the opposition at all. And they told us what the real threat to Scotland's economy is. And they told us, they told us why the subdued nature of the economic performance, of course, haven't outperformed in the last year. They told us the greatest threat to Scotland's economy isn't the workplace parking levy. They actually told us it was Brexit, not mentioned by the Conservatives in today's contribution. Which takes me to the second paper that I want to speak about once again. And I have to say I'm disappointed from the Labour Party too. The Chief Economist, the Chief Economist has published a report saying that if there's an no-deal Brexit, which most of us agree, is increasingly likely because of the actions of the Prime Minister and her red lines. And what they are taking this country towards is a recession with their eyes wide open. A recession. What does that mean to people? A hundred thousand people unemployed. A contracting economy. Business failure. The, those most vulnerable, hardest hit. That's what these people are taking us towards and they should be ashamed of themselves for that catastrophe. And the fact I will take an intervention. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his intervention. Despite his amateur dramatics, does he not think that the best thing the SNP could do to protect the Scottish economy is get behind the deal uh, that the Prime Minister is trying to secure for the whole of the United Kingdom? Derek Mackay. You see, I might appear dramatic because I believe every word I am saying. I am not that sure that the Conservatives feel the same. The alternative to a no deal is no Brexit. And we've set out compromises that the UK government have steadfastly refused to listen to. Willing destruction and negative impact on the Scottish uh, economy and even the Prime Minister's deal damages the economy as well. And do you know if there is tax divergence coming, it's partly coming through the actions of a right-wing extremist Tory government who choose as an act of fiscal irresponsibility to give at this time tax cuts to the richest in society when yes, our public services need support. But we all know who the Tories really want to tax. Let's remember who they want new taxes for. The poor, ill health, prescription charges, education, tuition fees, and do not dare to be poor and have more than two children in Tory-run Britain. What a disgrace the Tory party have become. And if I followed the Tory tax plans, we would cut half a billion pounds from our public services rather than grow our public services, which is what this budget supports. Now, I would say, I'll take a further intervention. Kezia Dugdale. Back to reality, can I say to him that care provision in Edinburgh is not good enough? These are not my words, but the words of Jean Freeman in a letter to me that I received this morning. Before five o'clock, can he tell me how cutting £14 million from Edinburgh's health and social care budget and £9 million from NHS Lothian is going to help my constituents desperately waiting a care package? Cabinet Secretary. Because this budget offers a substantial increase to social care, a record amount in health spending, a substantial increase to local government, a real terms increase in resource to local government. By opposing this budget, the Labour Party is opposing additional expenditure for those services in Scotland. And that's what we're voting on tonight. Let me return briefly to Conservatives, who we've heard many positions from. They want to raise less and spend more. Now, I'm finding out about uh, council tax decisions at this point in time. And despite everything you've heard from the Conservatives about council tax and other taxes, I understand that Perth and Kinross Council, Tory-led, is increasing council tax by 4%. 
4% isn't what you promised the electric, and we've increased local government budgets, which just goes to show on so many matters in relation to the Conservative Party, you can take as many positions as you like. You don't need to defect. You can take any position you like in the Conservative Party and stay within the party. To the Labour Party, I say this in all seriousness, the Labour Party knows they brought no credible budget alternative to my office. And when asked to name councils whose budgets were going down, James Kelly ran away from his own question. And no wonder he ran away. Let's take Glasgow City Council. More resources coming from the Scottish Government and, of course, clearing up the mess left by the Labour Party while they deny justice to women on equal pay. And this Government and the SNP administration, rather than taking the women to court, took them to justice and those payments will be made. Now, Willie Rennie, Willie Rennie, Willie Rennie, the only thing I'm left with his contribution in the budget today is he wants me to show him my flagpole. I don't have a flagpole. I've got a patio. I'll show him the patio because it's on that that I stand firm foundations in the budget, presiding officer. What this budget, what this... Oh, no, I'm not taking one from Mr Rumbles either. <laughs> presiding officer, this budget, this budget, this budget... <laughs> I'll maybe reflect in my language in relation to Willie Rennie, but it's a, a very interesting offer. Um, in terms of the... In terms of the budget, presiding officer, we are proposing a £733 million increase in NHS resource. I'm, I'm winding up. Uh, increasing the total spending on the NHS in £13.9 billion. Local government increasing in real terms by £300 million. £2.4 billion on education, enterprise and skills, enhancing social security. £5 billion on capital investment, supporting our infrastructure for now and the future. Expanding the childcare of our country. Real terms protection for police resource budgets. Investing in the economy through the National Investment Bank, the uh, National Infrastructure Mission for Scotland, the most competitive package of non-domestic rates relief, more support and investment into transport, a record investment in housing, a £50 million fund for the town centres of Scotland. Murdo Fraser spoke about a parliamentary shambles and he certainly speaks from authority when he talks about the shambles that is the Westminster government. But in Scotland tonight, we have an opportunity. Scotland expects us to deliver. This budget delivers for Scotland yeah, yeah. and I would encourage all members of the Scottish Parliament to deliver tonight and vote for the Scottish budget. Thank you very much, and that concludes our debate on the budget, and we're going to move straight to decision time. There is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 15907, in the name of Derek Mackay, on the Budget Scotland number no. 3 bill, be agreed. And because this is a stage three of the Budget Bill, we will move straight to a division. So members may cast their votes now. Vote on motion 15907 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes 66, no 58. The motion is therefore agreed and the Budget Scotland Bill number three is passed. <laughs> and that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>